Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Johannes Stralla. I'm a journalist at Estonian Public Broadcasting, and today I'm privileged to host this high-level energy conference organized by the Nordic Council of Ministers and its office in Tallinn. We are in the middle of a very dynamic and challenging time. The policy context, as you all know, is changing rapidly, both at national, EU and global level. The European Green Deal sets out an ambitious path to transform the European energy market and economy as a whole. So where are the Nordic and Baltic states today? What are the key changes in energy policy as we move towards 2030? And how do we achieve climate neutrality by 2050? We will start today's discussions in a bottom-up fashion with some warm-up sessions before we move to the policy panel. We have great speakers discussing the potential of offshore wind energy in the region. We will look at energy efficiency in the building sector and system integration and the role of hydrogen. As the European Green Deal roadmaps have shown, in order to reach the 55% emission reduction target in 2030, we have to step up the pace. The Nordic and Baltic countries are often perceived as front runners. In order to share best practices in the region, we will highlight some of the great examples on policies and business plans that are responding to the targets of European Green Deal. Now, this is a very timely discussion. As you all know, new proposals under the so-called Fit for 55 package are expected from the European Commission already in mid-July. We know that the revised directives will lift the ambitions within renewable energy and energy efficiency. Later this year, we will most likely see proposals to adjust the gas market legislation in order to introduce hydrogen and decarbonize the gas grid. We can also expect the follow-up on the renovation wave. Therefore, we are very proud to have the EU Energy Commissioner Katri Simson present at our policy panel today, and we're also privileged to have the Lithuanian Energy Minister, Nordic Baltic Top Administration and regional energy companies joining us to discuss the reality that the Green Deal will bring. Ladies and gentlemen, you can of course all take part in the conversation by typing your questions to the web interface. Uh, next to each and every speaker you see a button Q&A. If you type your questions there, my dear colleagues here will assist me that I can ask them from the speakers. With that, it's time to get rolling. We'll start the day with the first warm-up session, which will be on offshore wind. Our first speaker is Pierre Tardieu, who represents the major players in the wind energy sector. He is the policy officer at Wind Energy Europe. Mr. Tardieu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and to be uh, delivering the first warm-up uh, discussion. So uh, congratulations, uh, uh, enjoy, uh, grab a warm coffee, uh, and uh, let's go. So uh, indeed, I'm Pierre Tardieu, Chief Policy Officer uh, at Wind Europe, and I just want to distill a few facts uh, about offshore wind, its potential, and discuss a little bit the dimension in the Baltics, uh, plus uh, a couple of uh, pointers on uh, where to go next. Now, Offshore wind um, is, according to the European, to the International Energy Agency, uh, going to be the top uh, technology in terms of uh, power generation in Europe by 2040. Um, and you can see this, uh, the various contributions uh, of the various technologies uh, in the coming decades. Onshore wind is, of course, not far behind, um, and, and solar will, will play a, a key role as well. Uh, what's important to note here is that uh, these figures from the International Energy Agency are even before the EU put its uh, climate law on the books and committed to multiplying by 25 um, the contribution of offshore wind to, uh, to its power mix to 300 gigawatts by 2050. Uh, these ambitions uh, are uh, significant, they're great, 
we are convinced that the industry uh, can deliver, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the boundary conditions in order for this to happen. But before we do that, let's uh, take a, uh, a bit of a stock as to where offshore wind stands uh, in Europe today. It's 3% uh, of Europe's uh, power mix with 25 gigawatts installed uh, across Europe. What you can see here um, on this map are the various wind farms at various stages uh, of development, uh, with the red uh, wind farms being already grid connected, and then the others, the various shades of blue uh, and green at various uh, stages uh, of development. And clearly, uh, apart from uh, the Irish Sea and the North Sea, the Baltic um, has been one of the cradles um, of the European and indeed the global offshore um, industry. Now, if we uh, weigh the various sea basins uh, in comparison, of course, uh, the North Sea remains uh, the, uh, the, the engine so far of offshore wind development. Nevertheless, the Baltic Sea represents a significant chunk uh, at roughly 10%. And we believe uh, very strongly that this is uh, bound to increase uh, in order for Europe to really tap uh, the formidable potential that we have in the Baltic Sea. It's shallow waters, it's strong and stable winds, um, and we believe uh, um, a supply chain that is able to deliver um, in, in the short and medium term. What does it look like in the coming years? the various contributions of the sea basins. Um, of course, the North Sea uh, will continue uh, its very significant contribution. Uh, but in the, uh, in the orange, uh, the Baltic is significantly incre increasing its contribution. What you're looking at here is uh, annual installations uh, per sea basin. Uh, and we're going to see much more of a geographical balance uh, with indeed the Baltic playing uh, a big part. Breaking it down by country, uh, we believe at Wind Europe that by 2030, uh, there will be uh, 13 gigawatts of offshore wind um, in the Baltic. Uh, and you can see the various contributions here um, uh, from, from, from the respective countries. I would draw your attention, of course, to Poland, which uh, by many respects, um, is one of the uh, hottest markets uh, for um, offshore wind um, in the Baltic at the moment with lots of activities, uh, very clear targets, uh, a vibrant supply chain, and really um, this, you know, the largest developers flocking to Poland for, for developments. But beyond this, of course, uh, we will see uh, more in Germany, uh, and, and Denmark, which of course has a, a very strong established track record, um, as well as, uh, as in the Baltics, where we have um, very significant expectations for offshore wind developments going forward. Why do this, you may ask me. Why, why go offshore? Why try to harvest uh, this, uh, this uh, plentiful resource? Well, economics is a very strong driver. Um, offshore winds contributes uh, 7.5 billion in terms of uh, EU GDP uh, per year, all the activities uh, around uh, offshore winds. And if you break it down uh, and divide it by the number of turbines, each new offshore wind turbine installed in Europe contributes 15 million euros of economic activity. So this is, of course, the production, the installation, but it's it's the entire value chain here. Uh, it's the R&D, um, it's the operation and maintenance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all generating significant economic activity. And really, offshore wind has demonstrated its resilience uh, in, uh, in, in, in the past pandemic. In fact, in 2020, offshore wind attracted 26 billion euros um, of investments and has therefore um, a very bright future with the finance community really trusting the technology and banking uh, on it to drive the decarbonization of Europe's economy. Looking at jobs, there are already seven, 77,000 jobs uh, in offshore wind in Europe today. Um, if we were to deliver on our climate and energy objectives, uh, in particular, the 55% greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, that number would increase to 200,000. Certainly something 
uh, worth uh, worth going for um, in terms of economic development, skill development, um, et cetera, et cetera. How has this happened? How is Offshore Wind, which when I started uh, at Wind Europe, uh, was struggling uh, to compete uh, with uh, with conventional technology? Costs have come down phenomenally uh, over the last years. Uh, in fact, the costs have come down to by roughly 75% if you look at auction clearing uh, prices. And this is absolutely comparable now uh, to conventional energy, not, e not only in terms of cost, but in terms of, of stable outputs, and clearly one of the drivers uh, of, uh, of decarbonization of Europe's energy system. The technology has made leaps and bounds, uh, and this has been one of the drivers uh, for this cost reduction. Uh, whereas um, we used to install four or five megawatt turbines, now on average, the turbines installed in 2020 were 8.2 uh, megawatts, and we already have uh, on uh, on the books 15 megawatt turbines. The question is, what is going to be uh, the limit here? Uh, if uh, if we go to 20 megawatt turbines in the near future, um, the physics don't seem to be a, a problem, and therefore uh, we will continue to see cost reduction in offshore wind thanks to this technological driver. So how to make the most of this? Three points. Planning. We need to make sure that the policies allow for the long-term visibility uh, that is required to plan offshore wind farms. You can see on this, uh, on this um, schematic here uh, that uh, from the leasing to the installation, it takes a little bit more than, than 10 years. And therefore, it's critical to have the regulatory framework that gives that uh, visibility, the auction schedule, the budgets, and the long-term targets, of course. Critical to the planning is uh, an innovative and forward-looking approach to maritime spatial planning. We're talking about 300 uh, gigawatts uh, in Europe that will take roughly 7% of the sea space, and that needs to be planned in coordination with the other users uh, of the sea. Uh, it's no longer possible to treat uh, offshore wind as uh, the latest comer to the table. Uh, climate needs to be mainstreamed as part of the maritime spatial planning in order for the strategy to be successful. The offshore wind uh, supply chain I've discussed, um, we need to continue developing the supply chain um, in, in the region. Uh, this means uh, the operation and maintenance, this means uh, the cable laying, et cetera. And crucially, uh, it means developing the port infrastructure. Uh, with the components becoming very large, heavy, there's a huge need uh, more than $6 billion, uh, worth of investments uh, at European level in port infrastructure, which are really the interface um, with, uh, with offshore winds. We're talking about deep berths. We're talking about reinforced key sides that will be able to basically channel the huge offshore wind volumes um, and get these turbine, turbines out to sea and the clean electrons uh, back to the loads. Regional cooperation is, of course, critical, and I commend you for, uh, for today's events, uh, which is a, a sterling example uh, of this. Um, don't need to, to dwell on this, uh, only to say that, um, as we have seen uh, in, in, in other regions um, and in the North Sea, uh, cooperation is going to be critical to the success uh, of this uh, significant offshore wind rollout. And part of the reason why is because we're going to see more and more hybrid offshore wind farms that serve as generation uh, and interconnector. In fact, we believe that a third of offshore wind farms will be hybrids serving as generation and infrastructure uh, and interconnector by 2050, thereby saving copper, saving space in terms of uh, onshore landing points, helping to balance the energy system, uh, and broadly making sure that um, the transition to a net zero economy is cost effective. So with those few thoughts, uh, I leave you today, uh, wish you uh, an excellent discussion, uh, great energy for the rest of the day, uh, and thank you again for inviting Wind Europe to kickstart this discussion. Bye.
Thank you so much, Mr. Tardieu. We have actually received one question, so if you would kindly stay online, uh, I would ask that question. The question goes as follows. The current wind load factor uh, is 10% offshore, and 2020, the annual onshore average is 23.5%. Now, I didn't come up with that statistics. You may correct uh, the person who asked that question, yes. but uh, he asks, yeah. or she asks, what use is a capacity that has a low capacity factor? So offshore wind has uh, typically a much higher capacity factor than onshore winds because it's further, uh, it's further out, stronger and more stable winds. Um, so new offshore wind farms typically have a capacity factor around 50% or, or even higher when we're talking about floating uh, offshore winds. Um, and this is gradually increasing, which is why I was saying that uh, offshore winds uh, has a similar uh, characteristic to conventional energy and can be counted on to supply uh, uh, a reliable, uh, to be a reliable source of green electrons going forward. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Tardieu. I'm pretty sure our next speaker has um, offshore wind energy on his mind. It's time to hand over the floor to the CEO of Este Energia and Enefit, Mr. Hanto Sutter, who will discuss how to get over the dependence on fossils. <laughs> Good morning um, uh, from Tallinn. Uh, uh, happy to be with you and contribute uh, to uh, this great discussion of uh, practical steps implementing uh, Green Deal, as uh, we are uh, one of the leading uh, renewable energy uh, generators uh, by today in the region. Uh, then uh, uh, I think that we, with our experience uh, going back already uh, uh, almost uh, uh, 15 years, uh, we have uh, uh, some ideas to share. So um, renewable energy has developed very rapidly over the past uh, decade, and this is a fact uh, what we can see. Uh, but um, as uh, recently it's agreed uh, that in Europe uh, we need to reach to uh, uh, carbon neutrality in the next uh, 30 years, then uh, we have to see where we are actually standing at the moment. The ambition is uh, great, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we know that the uh, reduction so far on the carbon emissions has been an uh, energy sector. But we should also see where we are in a, in a total, because it uh, doesn't matter from where the emission is coming. Uh, it is still there. So uh, fossil fuels in EU are uh, today uh, representing 71% uh, uh, of the cross available energy, uh, which is a, a huge amount, as we can see. And uh, maybe it's also important to say that uh, in uh, uh, past uh, 10 years, we have managed only to reduce uh, 11 percentage points uh, altogether. Uh, and if we see a global uh, situation, it's even worse. Uh, today, uh, uh, fossil fuels are representing around 80% of the energy. So, um, if we if we want to uh, actually uh, uh, go ahead from here and change the situation, we uh, can shift uh, electricity generation to renewables, uh, but it will not solve the challenge uh, what we face. So electricity accounts today only um, around 25% of the uh, final energy consumption. So uh, oil and gas altogether are accounting more than half. So um, uh, if we want to uh, uh, change the situation, we have to uh, basically uh, take uh, much bigger steps. So uh, now how to, uh, how to come uh, further? And we see uh, one uh, uh, very good uh, solution uh, considering the current technologies, uh, uh, what we know is electrification. Uh, so I mean a switch from fossil fuels to clean and renewable energy. And um, I truly believe that electrification is the most critical enabler of the decarbonization and the single biggest opportunity for this uh, upcoming decade. The power sector has a totally new role uh, in this uh, change. So electricity companies will deliver low carbon solutions, whether that is for transport, heating, uh, uh, industrial processes, uh, uh, for uh, consumers in their homes, um, etc. 
So uh, the other side of the story is, uh, of course, from where this uh, green uh, power is coming. Uh, and uh, we need to supply these energy solutions with a clean uh, electricity and in a very fast uh, growing uh, demand. So not only supply, but renewable electricity production must uh, multiply and the share of electricity in final energy consumption must reach at least uh, 50%. And uh, electricity annual uh, uh, production in Europe is currently about uh, uh, 2,800 uh, terawatt hours. Um, and uh, solar and wind represents around the one-fifth, 20% out of this. So electricity consumption uh, will increase uh, 2.5 times by 2050 on the basis of various forecasts. And if we now come back to uh, uh, the mathematics and think what it means uh, to replace existing production with renewables and then uh, double the capacity, so all together wind and solar energy capacity must, must increase also about the 10 times. So uh, we will not be able to achieve this goal with, uh, uh, without the large-scale uh, uh, generation units. And the offshore wind uh, uh, is, a, uh, of course, a key role in this change. Uh, this is known to be, uh, to be the best, fastest and most uh, affordable option today. Of course, uh, with the storage technologies, uh, with the wider use uh, uh, of hydrogen as the best uh, known uh, technology for storage uh, today. Baltic Sea holds incredible potential of uh, offshore wind uh, and uh, it's described as much as 90 gigawatts. The keywords are here, a cooperation, regional approach and the political uh, willingness, of course. Uh, offshore projects are large, uh, investments are counted in billions uh, of euros. They cannot be done on a country by country basis, but uh, we need a more uh, regional approach, which is absolutely clear. We as a market participant uh, would very much like uh, the market to provide enough certainty today to uh, build a new large uh, production capacities. Uh, the reality is that the market does not uh, work the same uh, uh, everywhere today. Our electricity market is not in a position to finance uh, large uh, projects uh, um, uh, as uh, investments are huge and uh, payback uh, terms are uh, 20, uh, even uh, more years. And I will point out uh, just a few factors. Limiting transmission capacities or allowing unfair competition from a third countries uh, until the fundamentals are fixed, the support schemes are implemented, uh, which creates a different competition uh, between the uh, countries. So you know that the investors uh, are good in mathematics and analytics. So uh, uh, we are looking at the most uh, favorable grounds and uh, best opportunities uh, for the investments. Uh, today, offshore development is uh, more uh, uh, like a beauty contest between the national support schemes. But the generation from those parks is coming uh, to the one and single European uh, uh, power market. As long as this is the case, uh, uh, it illustrates that the political will alongside with the cooperation to implement the energy transition is not at the same level everywhere and uh, in all the countries. Some want to move faster uh, than others, uh, and preferably the conditions should be harmonized in, in the EU, at least uh, in the Nordics and the Baltics, uh, as, a, as we want to be a front runners. And we managed to, uh, uh, for instance, to open the power markets the first in this region and uh, be uh, pioneers on the uh, uh, first uh, power markets in, uh, in the world. The only way to find out the best projects in, uh, uh, in, in this is the fair competition. I would even say, say that the uh, uh, technology neutral regional uh, market uh, approach would uh, be uh, the solution. Um, as you saw uh, on the slide, uh, 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 we have uh, currently very, very um, uh, different situation. I have been demonstrating only uh, the Baltics and uh, and the Poland. Poland was just uh, uh, recently coming up uh, the uh, subsidy scheme uh, for the 25 years on the offshore, uh, uh, offering a 67 uh, 
uh, euros per megawatt hour. Uh, Lithuania is planning to do the same. I didn't add here the other countries in the northern Europe, but uh, but if you take this picture, you will understand that actually uh, this is not a good starting point. So my message uh, here uh, is that uh, uh, well harmonized, uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, goal to uh, market-based investments is a is a good idea. But as we need uh, uh, really the added uh, green power in a very fast basis, and the project they take time, uh, a long time in uh, in uh, big uh, big investment uh, projects. Then we need to go and move now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sutter. Perhaps just one question. As we rush to renew the energy mix of the EU, and as you said, you need guarantees to uh, build those large offshore wind farms, how can we be sure that the taxpayers' money is used in the most effective way, that we just don't spend away um, having those very ambitious targets on our mind? <laughs> Yeah, this is a very fair question, and um, and uh, as I said, that we should uh, actually put uh, conditions in place uh, to uh, allow uh, investments into the new generation capacities on a market base in the future. But unfortunately, we haven't seen recently uh, in Europe uh, investments into the new generation, uh, uh, which are truly uh, market base, and uh, we see. Uh, very, very different subsidy schemes uh, by the uh, fundamentals and uh, also the uh, scale. Um, and um, uh, then this power is coming to the uh, to the one single uh, power market and uh, causing a big uh, distortions. Uh, also, as a uh, uh, EU uh, has put a very high uh, toll on the uh, um, environmental uh, side, then uh, any third uh, countries uh, um, uh, intervention is also uh, distorting the market. So that uh, my my message was that we, we should aim uh, to uh, to the conditions on the market uh, where we can uh, invest the market based. But uh, so far, in order to keep up the speed and uh, and have the power available at any time in the future, we need to uh, find the uh, most. Uh, uh, transparent and um, straight ahead uh, uh, and uh, hopefully harmonized uh, subsidy schemes, or I would even call uh, uh, guarantees uh, to the uh, investors. How's the work progressing with uh, the first Estonian Latvian uh, offshore wind farm? Any news? It goes very well. Uh, we just announced the uh, international tender for the uh, environmental impact um, assessment uh, process. Uh, we plan to sign a, a contract uh, with the uh, partner uh, uh, compl uh, completing this study already uh, before the end of this summer. And uh, yeah, uh, we have also uh, uh, announced uh, recently a partnership with uh, uh, Bird Best. Uh, 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 operator and developer Ørsted uh, uh, Rasmus will be also participating later today. So uh, I'm extremely uh, excited and hopeful that uh, this will be the first uh, operating uh, offshore uh, wind park in the Baltics. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sutter, and uh, good luck in uh, making those great goals a reality. But let's move on with our second uh, warm-up session. As you all know, we're privileged to live in a region that has four seasons. Now, that also means we have to, in order to keep warm, we have to heat our houses during, well, most of the year. Half of the EU energy consumption comes from heating or cooling buildings, and in order to keep our noses above water and our feet nice and warm, we have to make sure that our houses are energy efficient. Now, that is exactly the topic of our second session, and I'm pleased to hand over the floor to the head of energy finance from the Ministry of Economics of Latvia, Mr. Kati Silovs. Hello, good morning from Riga. Um, 
Unfortunately, before I start my presentation, I should apologize. There is something wrong with our IT system, so um, I could be disconnected, disconnected at any time. So I, I'll hope uh, my presentation goes smoothly, but uh, today my computer crashed already. So I'm, I'm sorry if anything happens. So, but let's start with, with presentation. Uh, my presentation is about um, Latvian experience with energy efficiency programs. As already moderator said, we had four seasons, uh, winter, uh, cold autumn, and typically cold spring too. So um, we have three, three seasons where we ha have to heat our houses. And not only houses, but also our offices, or schools, or uh, hospitals, and, and many more buildings. Um, in Latvia, we have several uh, programs uh, uh, regarding uh, energy efficiency of different uh, different housing. Um, for example, we have uh, energy efficiency programs for uh, government-owned uh, owned buildings, which are typically government institutions, or uh, municipality-owned uh, buildings, which are typically schools or hospitals. Now, those are pretty straightforward and easy programs. Those are grants, which are disbursed mostly from European structural funds to particular municipality or government institution, which uh, renovates its building and makes it more energy efficient, efficient. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward programs. But um, uh, the complicated program, which well, I'll describe a bit more, is about uh, energy efficiency in multi-apartment uh, residential buildings. Oh. Yes, uh, so um, in Latvia we have uh, many thousands of, uh, of buildings and up, up until now only thousands of uh, buildings has been renovated. Why? Mostly it's just issue of money because large scale renovation of multi-apartment buildings has started only when European structural funds has been available starting from year 2007 in significant amounts. There has been a couple of buildings renovated from own uh, finances from, uh, uh, from, from uh, owners of those buildings, but they're just simply a couple of buildings compared to thousand already uh, renovated from structural funds. Um, there has been two programs. First was from 2007 to 2013, uh, managed by Latvian Investment Development Agency, which is uh, abbreviated as OLIA. And from 2014 up until now, there is uh, uh, another multi-apartment residential uh, renovation program managed by Altum, which is Latvia's development uh, bank. State-owned uh, financial institution, tasked with implementing um, support programs. And uh, this uh, uh, multi-apartment uh, residential building, it's, it's about half or one third of all the Altums, Altums programs in terms of financing, in terms of number of, um, number of uh, projects involved, there is a, a, another, um, pro, uh, another programs which are bigger. Um, this uh, Altum program is co-financed by European Development Fund. Uh, there is money for grants. Uh, also, uh, because of COVID crisis, this money has been uh, increased in, uh, la uh, in, in, in last year by 30 million. Uh, but also, it has um, very significant uh, co-financing uh, well, co from commercial banks. Uh, we uh, do a lot to involve commercial banks in implementation in, of this program. Uh, commercial banks receive uh, guarantees and incentives from Altum uh, to implement uh, to implement this program. So. I'm sorry, but my internet clicker is not working. I'm trying to click the next slide. Yes, oh, it's worked. Sorry, again, IT problems. So uh, the Autumn provides 
loans and guarantees to commercial banks. And the idea of this program is to involve commercial banks with uh, as much um, uh, as much as incentives as possible. And typically, the multi apartment house goes to bank um, for the loan for renovation of multi apartment broke. So the house goes to regular, typical Latvian commercial bank, just like Swedbank, Sebank, or any other bank. This bank then goes to Altum and asks whether it needs guarantee for this house. Altum also covers 50% of renovation uh, costs for this house. This, this way, we are stimulating um, Latvian commercial banks to credit as much as possible uh, renovation of multi-apartment houses. Uh, there is a problem, however, uh, because uh, banks are, well, they apply their normal, regular crediting policies for, for those multi-apartment houses. Uh, and there is uh, houses who just plain get rejected by banks for various reasons. And in this uh, uh, case, uh, this house can go to directly to Altum and ask not only for the grant, 50% from the costs, but also for loan for other 50%. So in case commercial bank doesn't consider um, this house worthwhile uh, to, um, to be credited, then Altum takes up crediting in full for this house. So there's two kind of projects. One kind is house goes to commercial bank and asks for uh, the loan. Other kind is uh, house goes to Autum and asks for the loan and also receives um, uh, grant. So um, uh, in any way, Autum covers 50% of the uh, costs for the renovation of uh, building. Uh, who does what? So, as I explained, commercial banks apply their very typical uh, due diligence of like typical credit um, credit scoring and everything else, and also they pre-screen documents and uh, make sure everything is okay because it, it is in their interest to to make sure that. Uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, house will receive a uh, grant from Altum because Altum has to check quality of the uh, documents submitted by the home uh, homeowners to, to the Altum uh, to make sure that this house can get uh, can get 50% grant. Uh, which is qu actually quite a big deal because, well, since this is the European structural funds, there is significant amount of paperwork needs to be done and significant amount of paperwork which needs to be uh, kept for the auditing reasons. So, lessons learned. It's not the easiest process because there is audits and checks and documentation has to be kept in specific way which we get criticized quite often. Uh, so it, again, it's a bit more complex than typical credit of the commercial bank. Uh, but uh, the, this model uh, allows to provide uh, support for uh, house renovation in any place in Latvia, not only in big cities, which are quite good credited by commercial banks, but also in rural areas and in for, for small size houses and everything which is deemed not very interesting by commercial bank. But however, if bank is interested, then the bank uh, provides uh, credit for those, bank, uh, for those houses. Uh, the good thing is that uh, payments for heating goes down significantly, at least a half of um, uh, heating bills is uh, ha uh, is being um, reduced, and that way, um, typical house can uh, basically uh, repay loan 
just using funds which has been uh, uh, reduced from the heating bills. And very typical house uh, in Latvia after the innovation typically looks about like that. So the typical house um, uses this opportunity to use money for uh, renovation uh, to, to, to reduce their heating, but also to uh, keep up the house and uh, to increase value of the house and comfort of living also, which is quite important. And it is um, technically, it is, uh, we, we are able to do it just for the money, which is uh, reduced uh, heat payments. So thank you for me. That's was that was my presentation, and if there is any questions, then I can answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Silov. So I do encourage uh, everyone in the audience to post your questions uh, using our web interface. And next to each and every speaker, you see a little button uh, uh, which says Q and A. If you click on that, you will have a chance to ask questions, but uh, during one of the uh, warmest uh, periods uh, of our days, uh, when I actually feel that uh, I'm where the studio is set up in a very well insulated space and we would need some additional cooling solutions, uh, we shall move on with our uh, next speaker. So thank you once again, Mr. Silovs. Uh, I'm now pleased to hand over the floor to the Interim Head of Public Affairs and Sustainability at Danfoss Group, Julie Kestrup. Yes, um, good morning and thank you so much for inviting me to part the discussion today. It's a topic I'm very, very passionate about, even more so than the next Danish win the European Cup. Um, and it's also a topic we really can't exhaust. There's so much to talk about, but there is even more for us to actually do. So I'm based in Brussels, and I'm also involved in various associations and alliances on this very topic, um, including Euroace, the Association for Energy Efficient Buildings, where I'm the current uh, president. Uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, I'm clicking here. This is a new system for me. So uh, my name is Judy Kestrup, and as was just introduced, I head up public affairs, including EU affairs at Danfoss. And if you don't know Danfoss, we are a global manufacturer of energy efficient solutions. And here are some key figures for us. And here is just a a key overview of some of the markets we serve. So we produce solutions that optimize uh, basically the energy efficiency. Uh, and so sustainability is quite literally um, our business. We're involved in a number of sectors, as you can see, um, including residential and commercial buildings, but also heating and cooling more broadly. And as we learned in the opening remarks, heating and cooling is a substantial issue for people in our part of the world. So. Um, this is basically where we are. We've agreed at EU level to be carbon neutral by 2050, and that's a tall order. We can only execute it using a two-pronged approach of energy efficiency and renewables. And the renewables overall get a lot of attention, also politically, but it's energy efficiency that's the foundation of our success. According to the IEA, we can meet about 40% of our Paris target with energy efficiency alone, uh, and that will also be the quickest and most cost-efficient way to do it. So that's why that the energy efficiency first approach that we also talk about at the European level is so important. But it can't just be empty words. Um, and at the moment, it sort of is, because at a time where we know that we need to focus more on energy efficiency, and we know that we also need to focus more on the buildings, there is actually less investment on a global level going into energy efficiency. And at EU level, we're also not uh, on track to meet the energy efficiency target. And now that's going to go up as part of the Fit for 55 exercise. So buildings, why are they so essential? I mean, first of all, it's where we spend 90% of our time. It's our homes, our workplaces, our places of comfort, of care and of education. But more important in the context of the event today, they stand between us and the decarbonisation of the EU by 2050 that we have committed to as a union. We need to reduce the overall um, energy demand of buildings by 80%. That's a substantial figure. And about 75% of the buildings in the EU today are not energy efficient. Now, you can look at that with a positive eye, of course, and say, well, um, if there are so many buildings that aren't efficient, that also means there's a lot of potential. Uh, but it is a tall order. Here is a photo from Copenhagen from pretty much today. Uh, but Copenhagen year 2050 will not look vastly different. Yes, I mean, there are very many sort of cool, futuristic, highly energy efficient buildings popping up across Europe. 
the kinds that people like me would like to put in our slides to show you what is possible. Uh, they're inspiring. We should keep on doing them and we should keep on sharing them. And we should also keep legislation to make sure that new buildings that are built are built to the very highest standards and are optimized for efficiency and comfort. But the vast, vast majority of the buildings that will stand across Europe in 2050, so the foundation for decarbonizations, are the ones that stand today. That needs to be that means that we need to up our game and we need to do it quickly because in building renovation uh, cycle terms, 29 years is very little. It's pretty much one cycle. And here you can see where we are today. Um, so as many as 95% of today's buildings will still be standing in 2050, and less than 1% of the buildings currently undergo energy efficient renovation. And what's worse, the average energy saving for energy renovation projects at the moment is 9%. When we look at the number of buildings today that are actually renovated at a deep renovation standard, so that means a reduction of 60% of the energy usage, the number is 0.2%. And these, by the way, are figures from the Commission's own impact assessment from, from last year. So these are the uh, figures upon which the Commission then builds its uh, work. So as you can see, there's lots to do, um, and we need to do that quickly. So what about the renovation wave then? Is that, uh, is that a saving for us? I should say, first of all, that in the energy efficiency in buildings community, we were very, very excited when it was announced because we've been saying for many years now that energy efficiency is good. It improves improvement performance, it saves money, it creates better indoor environments and it boosts job creation. Um, so it was really excellent to hear the commission really take this issue um, to the fore and bring those arguments, the very same arguments that we've been saying in the community for many years to the uh, foreground. And what the renovation wave aims to do is to do sort of a holistic approach and a holistic perspective on EU buildings policy that goes beyond sort of the specific uh, EPPD, so the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive uh, remit. And that's overall a really good thing. But it also means that we need to be really, really careful to make sure that all these different intervention points are aligned to ensure that there is full coherence and make sure that policies actually deliver on the plan, because a plan is only as good as its implementation. Uh, and when we look at the EED, the Energy Efficiency Directive, and the EPPD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, that are both up recast this year, they need to be ambitious, but they also need to be precise, because when it comes to buildings, the devil is in the detail. We can also see that the overall in, uh, ambition level put forward in this renovation wave um, is actually not enough. What we need is a tripling of renovation rates, whereas the renovation wave foresees a doubling. And what we need is an 80% reduction rather than just 60. So we need to do all this, all these very good ideas, and then we need to do more. And by the way, just when I talk about deep renovation, what we talk about is a renovation that uses a combination of technologies that address the energy losses in the fabric of the buildings, and then coupled with highly energy efficient equipment and controls within the building, so both the passive and the active energy. But I think while Corona has been devastating uh, on so many and not least personal accounts, when it comes to boosting renovation rates, I am actually somewhat hopeful. Because first of all, people have really understood the importance of having a comfortable home, having spent so much time in it over the last year. But also the massive recovery packages are to a very large extent built around climate and energy. And we know that energy efficiency in buildings is the biggest job booster of all subsectors. And again, we've got figures from the IEA, but also from Europe citing that 1 million euros invested into energy efficiency in buildings specifically will create between 18 and 30 local jobs. So I think the the the, the nascent sort of uh, political uh, um, prioritization of renovation in combination with the funds that are available is going to be very, very important to boost this um, agenda. And I'm realizing I didn't click my slide here, so I'm just going to click that one. There you go. Uh, I think my clicker has stalled. Nope, there we go. Uh, there we go. So that was the slide I was just talking to about. On the one hand, the renovation set, uh, RAFE setting the policy framework, and then on the other hand, the national recovery plans, which very tangibly, of course, have been asked to deliver at least 37% of the investments on energy and climate. And I think, as we just heard from the speaker before us, what that then amounts to as well at member state level is some very tangible plans that often focuses on exactly this. So what is it then we need to go from here? Um, I could share a long list, and I certainly have many, many things on my wish list, but if I can just summarize into a few here, then first of all, we need an overall target that is ambitious and binding. It sets the overall uh, ambition. 
it underlines that we are serious about energy efficiency and that we're seriously about energy efficiency in uh, buildings. Um, and if we truly, as Europe, mean business, then this is where we should show it. Then the second point, really important, it's coherence and integration. Everything is on the table at the moment in terms of energy legislation, and that's a big opportunity because if we put the energy pieces back together in a way that is clever, we have some really strong foundations for an integrated energy system with buildings at the core as an essential infrastructure because buildings are not just buildings. Buildings are really sort of a key part of the, of the adjacent energy system. Third, this is very much uh, a numbers game. The more buildings are in scope, uh, the faster it'll go. So it's essential that all publicly owned buildings renovate. Uh, creating that scale will bring down costs and it will also help optimize solutions and uh, pathways. So again, making sure that the, the, the public uh, sector goes first will go a long way towards creating a real wave that will then hopefully take the rest of the sectors with it. Um, and quite apart from the uh, extra benefits around lower bills, and my, the previous speaker also mentioned it, we shouldn't underestimate the uh, impact, for instance, of improved uh, indoor climate. Now, when we talk about comfort, that sounds a bit like luxury, but comfort translates into less days of sick. It translates into better concentration. It translates into better school results. It translates into a more efficient workforce. So, you know, I think really the work sort of, of comfort does not really truly encompass all that we have to gain apart from the, uh, from the energy gains from having a more regulated uh, and comfortable workspace. The fourth point ties in from number two. We want to decarbonize Europe in the most cost effective and fastest way. And that means not just looking at the individual building or the individual heat pump or the individual road, but looking at the overall infrastructure and making sure we integrate. By integrating waste heat, create charging infrastructure for e-mobility, connecting to renewables and so on and so forth, we create a system that is much smarter, much more dynamic and much more flexible. And that means that the overall infrastructure we need to serve our system will be smaller. And finally, it seems banal, uh, but we know this is a major hurdle. And again, the previous um, speaker talked about it. Access to qualified and thorough information is a major, major hurdle for uptake. It needs to be easy to understand the options on the table. Uh, this goes for Mr. and Mrs. Dupont, so the people on the street, but also for public and private entities. And the previous speaker mentioned specifically this concept of the one-stop shop that we're also very much in favor of. Um, and on the top of that, what we need to do is to make sure that that information arrives with you at a time where you have like a natural trigger point when you buy, when you sell, when you lease, or when you're anyway doing other uh, renovation work. Or if there are specific, specific funding opportunities, as is the case now with the renovation, uh, uh, the um, recovery packages. So I think so, those are some of the key points and a really important topic. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Again, I'm very happy to take questions, comments, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for a great overview of the challenges uh, ahead. I would just uh, perhaps add uh, one challenge, finding or having access to an actual construction worker who would renew your heating and cooling systems. I've been looking for a company for a few months now and uh, well, I'm still uh, hoping to uh, get my apartment renewed before it gets uh, cold. But. Uh, as we haven't received uh, any questions uh, from the audience, Julie, thank you so much again for a great overview. And we will move on with the third uh, warm-up session. Now, we will look at the energy system integration and uh, the role of hydrogen and carbon capture. I'm pleased to hand over the virtual floor to Simon Bennett, who is the innovation lead for energy supply and investment outlooks at the International Energy Agency. Mr. Bennett, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Johannes. Thank you for the for the warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in, a, in a virtual sense, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to share some of the insights from recent work at the International Energy Agency. This is a slight switch of, of gears, I think, from some of the previous presentations. I'm not going to uh, focus too much on, on Europe. I'm going to draw heavily on some work that we did recently on a global net zero emissions roadmap, uh, because I think that the insights from that really are quite well aligned with the ambitions that, that Europe has. And it draws out the role of, of hydrogen and, and CCUS. Uh, just at the very top of the presentation, for those that aren't aware, uh, CCUS is carbon capture, utilization and storage. It's the, the capture of the CO2 emissions before they reach the, 
atmosphere and uh, contribute to global warming and preventing them from uh, from contributing further to climate change, usually by burying those uh, those CO2, the captured CO2 underground. Um, I have one small warning this morning, which is that there's some uh, building works that are out of my control happening next door. This is the, the continuing perils of working from home, uh, but hopefully that won't distract us uh, too much. Uh, so let's just start with the overview of, uh, of what the IA has been doing. We began last year uh, producing a new scenario called net zero by 2050, which reaches that target of net zero emissions by 20 by 2050 globally, and that's a and that's a really tough ask uh, in terms of kind of trying to work out the the most uh, feasible pathway uh, with all the right technologies in place and iterating the various different levels of those technologies so that they are actually harmonised. And that tells us a lot about the the future challenges for for system integration. We released that roadmap in May. Um, I'm sure that some of you are aware of it because it generated quite a few headlines around the world. And we've been very pleased with the impact that it has had in just stimulating the debate on what is really needed to make some of these uh, pledges that countries are making into reality. But let's go a little bit uh, deeper in terms of detail initially. And here is one of the results from, from that scenario work. And it just shows the amount of electricity generation in that scenario by 2050 from different sources. And in the left chart here, is just so striking in terms of how much wind and solar increase uh, compared to the total level of electricity generation uh, to date, which is uh, on the 2020 line of that chart, uh, where uh, unabated coal takes a fairly high share. Uh, we're really expanding well beyond that with, with wind and solar. This isn't capacity, this is actual generation. And you can see in the right-hand chart, chart how that breaks down uh, with wind and solar providing around two-thirds of the total electricity uh, in 2050. They can't do it all by themselves, but we really need to be prepared for an energy system that is dominated by these variable renewable sources. Um, Europe is certainly well aware of that and is on the right tracks here. But the place where uh, we are seeing more activity, more thinking that contributes to that result is that we are also going to increase the final consumption of electricity in transport, in heating, in a various number of applications to half um, of total final energy consumed by, by 2050. And then if you account for the amount of electricity that goes into hydrogen, which is consumed by energy users, or indeed further transformed into ammonia or synthetic fuels, then we're up to, uh, to over 60% uh, is uh, coming from electricity by that time. And that's a big change from where we are today. So one of the things that we'd like to focus people's minds on is the need for flexibility. And the IEA has a uh, a framework for thinking about uh, system integration of variable renewable energy, energy in the electricity sector specifically. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the different elements of this uh, of this framework, where we we look at the you know, what are the the levels of variable renewables on the system in a six point grading, uh, and each of these, if you um, were to go and find the relevant IEA reports, has certain measures and policy advice associated with it. But the key point here is that system integration uh, of renewables is critical to ensuring continuing electricity security. We believe that electricity security is going to move center stage in terms of electricity, in terms of energy security in general in the future. It's not going to be the only um, concern, but it's going to be one of the one of the key ones. And that you maintain resilience and security by having the right flexibility to integrate the renewables. When you get to levels five and six, you start to need uh, hydrogen uh, because that can provide some of the longer duration electricity storage that you might need. Or uh, maybe it's not storing electricity, maybe it's just providing uh, clean backup power by being able to store hydrogen. For example, hydrogen that's produced from fossil fuels with CCS. And there's the link with, with CCS, but uh, CCS can also be used to capture the emissions from natural gas generation plants and allow uh, firm power, so dispatchable power that can be brought online at any time to keep the, the system humming. At the moment, uh, the most advanced countries, if we look at places like Southern Australia or indeed Denmark, they're reaching level four. We don't have countries that are into five or six yet, but we need to be prepared 
to be hitting those those levels. Um, and it's it's actually quite a big step up from level three to level five in terms of policy preparedness. And as I think everybody uh, on this call will know, the you know the amount of groundwork that needs to be done in terms of the politics uh, and preparation. You know that's a that's a long term project bringing people. Uh, around the table, and uh, and we need to be having that in place in the next decade. You know, I think in in all countries in this in this roadmap, but uh, it will happen before that in in some. That being said, when we talk about hydrogen in this system integration of energy, not just electricity, hydrogen actually plays a number of additional roles, and I think it would be a shame to only look at hydrogen in the context of its contribution to the electricity system, and that's why. I've tried to draw up a few additional reasons why hydrogen, uh, question mark. Uh, the, the, the fundamental one that we need to remember is that when you use hydrogen for combustion or in a fuel cell, it doesn't produce carbon dioxide. It doesn't contribute to, to global warming. Uh, but it is not something that is not a fuel, obviously, that you can dig up. Uh, it's something that you need to make from other sources of energy. And that means that there's trade-offs. You're always losing a little bit of efficiency when you produce hydrogen. So you really want it to contribute to vital roles in the electricity system. And fortunately, there are a number of vital roles. Uh, and when we look at a real net zero system, it's a leading solution for these six things. How do you get high levels of variable renewable electricity I've mentioned, but also how do you replace coal and gas in industrial production, whether it's a very high temperature heat or whether it's a reducing agent in the steel sector. And that's of particular interest at the moment in, in the Nordics, uh, I know. We also you know, look at the transport sector, and we don't necessarily think that uh, we know all of the answers for direct electrification of all land-based transport. So there, are, there is potentially a role of hydrogen there. Another key role of hydrogen you know, it's just to maintain the benefits of market-based trade in energy, uh, by which I mean it's a fuel that can be stored, it's a fuel that can be traded relatively easily, unlike electricity over, over days or weeks, uh, and that provides you know, a, a relief valve to, to energy prices. And potentially, you know, if we get a, uh, an international trade going in the future, then it can act a little bit like, uh, like natural gas does today, to uh, also manage regional imbalances. Air transport is something that people talk a lot about, but also sea transport uh, is, is something that can potentially be uh, solved by hydrogen, uh, especially if we sort of constrain, as we did in our scenario, the levels of, of bioenergy to what the global community thinks is, is definitely feasible. Um, and I think a final thing that really requires a lot more thought is the challenges of full end use electrification uh, and I'm thinking here more about the you know the piped gases uh, that are going to industry or buildings it's not a, a done deal about the switch over entirely to to heat pumps or to electrification of of industry when do those moments happen when you can fully switch over from gases to uh, to electricity entirely I don't think that anybody has quite grasped what the planning is involved in that, and 2050 is just around the corner. Hydrogen, uh, but accompanied by, by biomethane and other gases, can play a role there. And again, we have this interaction with, with CCUS. CCUS applied to uh, the gases that are feeding industry um, through those pipeline networks, but also power generation as well. If you've got a reasonable content of biomethane in those pipelines, which is one of the solutions that we came up with in our, our net zero scenario, then you can start to capture bio origin CO2 and you can have uh, you know, carbon removal essentially that allows you to move towards the negative emissions that can meet your net zero target. I had thought about saying, uh, listing some things for why not hydrogen in this slide. Uh, and there are a number of reasons why we need to be cautious uh, about running full speed into, into hydrogen. But the truth is that despite the efficiency losses, despite the costs, despite some of the other concerns people have, when you get to 2050 and you need to have a net zero system, we can't see a way at the moment to avoid hydrogen. And we do believe that we need to scale up 
the effort into research and deployment so that it's ready in the in the 2030s. I could have put a slide up here around CCUS as well. Uh, CCUS for the countries that wish to pursue it has a very, very similar set of arguments and a very similar time frame in order to, to get that into commercial reality. But I have concentrated on hydrogen here. And when we put all of that together and we plot how much hydrogen gets deployed in, in this net zero scenario, it's an awful lot. Uh, and this is us trying to minimize uh, really the uh, the reliance on hydrogen because of some of those illicit emissions uh, efficiency losses, maximize the reliance on electrification. But 500 million tons of hydrogen by 2050 is essentially, you know, the natural, I think it's half the natural gas consumption um, around the world today. It's all of the natural gas consumption by users directly, end users directly. It's about the same as that industry today. If we were to produce that all from electricity, that would be approximately the world's total consumption of electricity today, about 90% of the world's total consumption of electricity today in 2050. We don't do that in our scenario. We um, balance between CCUS uh, applied to natural gas to produce the hydrogen and electrification. But the electricity that goes into hydrogen production is still equivalent to the US and China electricity generation today. And as you can see, as you get out towards 2050, more of it is going into power generation to serve those seasonal imbalances that I was talking about around system integration. And more of it also is going into the, the transport sector where I'm talking about um, sort of heavier duty road transport. But that's not where the initial deployment happens. The initial deployment is much more concentrated in, in industry uh, and some of the areas where we can directly substitute uh, hydrogen that's coming from fossil fuels today without any, any CCS applied to it. That's the, the picture from our scenario. Um, we have this year our first global hydrogen review that's going to be published uh, in, in September. We're just putting the final touches to our, our initial draft on that. We're going to be mapping where hydrogen stands around the world. We'll be looking at Europe compared to China, compared to the United States and, and Japan, uh, looking at the companies, at the, the costs, and we're going to be publishing this on an, on an annual basis. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through all of the points that are mentioned in, in this slide, and I'm sure that our next speaker is going to talk about some of the, the key things that, um, that we're aware of in the, in the market right now. But just to say, momentum in this sector is, is unprecedented. We think it's possible that some of the investment, which is you know, north of, of $10 billion in uh, hydrogen companies, just since January 2019, in terms of equity fundraising, you know, we think there's a chance that some of this is part of a of a hype cycle, um, but it's a very very big one, and we don't think that it's going to to crash back down to zero on the other side. But rather, there's enough momentum in the system, there's enough policy that's going to be put in place in order to uh, to sustain a great deal of hydrogen activity over the next ten years. And Europe is going to be a key focus of that. Uh, Germany, the European Commission, others are really ahead of the game in terms of the, the policies that are going to underpin the investments that are, that are going to happen. One of the key areas that we're watching most closely is how that policy translates into projects, which translates into investments in electrolyzer manufacturing. Electrolyzer manufacturing currently isn't sufficient to meet our targets globally. We're making a bigger effort at the IEA to track what's happening in China, which is difficult. So we think there's around three gigawatts in the world today. Um, but there's about nine gigawatts that with the right investments uh, could get built. And that's really needed in order to be able to meet the, uh, the global targets. The same is true in, um, in CCS coupled with hydrogen, uh, which is probably the most active area for, for CCUS projects around the world, certainly in, in Europe at the moment. Um, but the costs remain high. And just as a final note, we talk a lot about the, the cost reductions to electrolyzer manufacturing, which are going to enable this system integration in the future. But if we get down to the levels of hydrogen costs that the United States, for example, has recently said that it's aiming for, what that means mostly is that we're going to have very, very low cost uh, renewables or indeed natural gas uh, that, are, uh, that are going into that because the input costs are so important in hydrogen and people sometimes forget that. And if we have that, very, very low cost of renewables and business models that can harness that for hydrogen production and provide all the certificates, then we're going to be in a very strong space uh, going into the, into the next decade. 
I would like to, to close my presentation there uh, and thank you very much for your, for your time. I hope that we've given you a signal of what the IEA is doing and you can find more information on our website. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bennett. We have received a few questions. Let me just summon up uh, two or three of them. Uh, there's a question, what are the most promising developments with hydrogen interaction and a bit of skepticism as well? How can there be confidence in hydrogen providing meaningful storage if there are no real large-scale hydrogen to power technical solutions? So let me take the, the second of what those first in terms of the, the large-scale hydrogen to power solutions. So the presentation that I have given has, in a sense, worked backwards from the needs in, in 2050. And when we look at what those needs might be and how challenging it might be to, to supply some of those services, we've opted for what we think are the, the technologies that have the best potential and that we are most confident in. And actually, things like hydrogen turbines, things like uh, combusting ammonia from hydrogen in, uh, in turbines or in engines and using fuel cells on a large scale. We think that those are well enough demonstrated uh, for us to think they're leading solutions. Um, we perhaps don't have quite so much uh, knowledge of the integration of the production of hydrogen, the transport, the storage of hydrogen in things like salt caverns on a large scale, um, and then integrating it with the power generation in order to be able to make sure the electricity is available on demand. Uh, but we think that that combination of competing technologies relating to turbines, engines, uh, and fuel cells is sufficiently well developed in order for us to have, have confidence in it. I think that um, there are other parts of, uh, of the value chain here in terms of the, the shipping and aviation solutions that require a bit more work than the, the power generation ones. Um, I think the first question was about the, the most promising developments that we see um, I'm going to take that question in a, uh, in perhaps a policy sense rather than a, a technology sense. And the, the opportunity that has been provided by the pandemic in order for countries to start looking seriously at how to generate investment through good policy measures and through funding, uh, the, the fact that some of that work is now focusing on the demand side, focusing on how do we get uh, companies to want to use low carbon hydrogen instead of the hydrogen that they're using today in industry and in refining uh, and in, in other solutions and have built that value chain so that it feeds back through to the uh, to the investment signals for the manufacturing uh, and the research and development the things that the, the auction scheme that's been announced in in germany uh, low carbon fuel standards the way that they started to incorporate hydrogen some of these elements i think are, um, are really real ones to watch because if the demand isn't there then we're not going to get the investment at the other end of the of the pipeline however much we we focus on on the supply side thank you so much simon for uh, contributing to this discussion our next speaker is a scientist and an entrepreneur. As an innovator in the fuel cell technology market, he is focused in making the hydrogen of tomorrow the reality of today. Ivar Grusenberg, CEO of the Power Up Energy Technologies. The floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, I'm the CEO of Power Up Energy Technologies, and I, I wear the two hats always. I'm also the senior researcher of the National Institute of Chemical Physics and the Biophysics. And uh, I'm concentrating both in, in the entrepreneurship uh, role and the scientific role uh, on the hydrogen uh, research. And uh, what Power Up Energy Technologies is doing uh, it's manufacturing hydrogen fuel cell based uh, smart uh, electric generators uh, and, and the smart grid systems. And then how it's all made, uh, it's, it's a portable um, solution which can be also uh, mounted together uh, into the bigger system, which then can be connected with the solar panels and the wind turbines. And by that, uh, it can be. Uh, considered as a smart grid system also when the batteries are included. And this can be used then uh, for the var various apl of applications for the critical infrastructure, uh, like the mobile towers, uh, also for the hospitals, 
um, not uh, also excluding the, the maritime sector who needs something uh, more lightweight than the batteries are, and the hydrogen fuel cells are fitting perfectly to these applications. And obviously, the off grid homes and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, really, how we will do it, uh, we, and how it's uh, all connected with, uh, with the hydrogen economy, uh, we are really covering uh, the full value chain. Uh, because uh, when we came to the market in 2017, 18, we figured out there's a huge chicken and egg issue. So uh, we couldn't find the hydrogen. And then that's uh, why we started uh, discussions with, with uh, major players on the market, uh, the hydrogen producers, including Linde, Messer, uh, Air Liquide. Um, and then also, obviously, the local players like Alexela, who has one of the biggest um, uh, refilling uh, network. And um, that's how we, we came to the, to the solution where we are able really to provide the full value chain um, from the hydrogen uh, production to the distribution, uh, then the generators uh, where the hydrogen can be utilized. And, and this is all made happen together with the customers. So we are closely working together with end users. So we really actually know what they need. And um, uh, it only goes together really well with, uh, with the European Green Deal. Um, as all, we all know, Europe uh, has taken the huge uh, challenge to, to become the climate neutral by uh, 2050. And, and, and also by that, um, not only decreasing um, everything uh, related to CO2 uh, emissions in the transport sector, but also uh, decrease uh, the CO2 emissions in the industry, which is, I think, it's the, one of the biggest challenges uh, in human in history. So um, um, how the European countries have aligned uh, with this Green Deal, um, I think there is no country by now who hasn't been uh, taking the hydrogen actions by now, who haven't been at least uh, starting planning uh, the hydrogen infrastructure, um, has uh, not been considering hydrogen strategy if it's not yet made. So the, the leaders in, in this, obviously, uh, in this all planning and, and the strategy making, uh, these are the European big names uh, like Germany, France, uh, lead it, uh, fortunately, uh, by, by the smaller uh, uh, countries like Netherlands, Denmark. And, and uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is... Uh, what is announced that uh, the gasoline and diesel cars uh, will be banned in many countries, uh, including Sweden, for example. Also, uh, the France is uh, moving towards that, that from 2030, there will be no diesel available. Um, so I think this is the, the, the really the biggest challenge um, we have to face. And uh, this uh, uh, nine years are passing uh, extremely fast. Um, also, the Estonia, um, even though we do not have yet the hydrogen strategy, um, we have been pretty uh, moving fast um, and completing the hydrogen uh, res uh, research, uh, which is uh, actually 400 page uh, enormous document uh, covering the transportation sector, at the crit uh, covering also the, the critical infrastructure, uh, covering the, the industry, uh, the green ammonia production, uh, the e-fuels, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the risk assessment as well. And uh, this was uh, finalized in June 2021, just recently. Um, and um, this will be now followed by the hydrogen roadmap, um, hopefully by, by the end of this year, 2021. And, and then obviously the next step is the hydrogen strategy. So in Estonia, we have been also dealing now really actively last, uh, last two years, I would say, uh, with, with the hydrogen related topics. And that's why also um, 
it's it's a perfect place for the startups uh, like Power Up, uh, also for the big names like Elkogen. Um, so uh, I think many countries do not have two fuel cell companies uh, in present. Um, so also then looking into the European situation overall, um, we we are quite ahead in comparison to the uh, North America, for example. But still, um, Asia has fifty uh, percent of the of the refilling stations. So we have long way to go. Um, as you see from the numbers as well, uh, France has currently only five uh, working uh, refilling stations. And when we really uh, look into the closer into these refilling stations, then then quite often these are not operational or, or the, there's no access um, to to the everyday user. Uh, the same way uh, Denmark, only six, Netherlands, four. Uh, but this is just the start, obviously. Uh, the chicken and egg uh, issue needs to be solved, and, and this is a good starting point. And the Germany and, the, and, and France uh, actually are leading uh, the whole process. So I see uh, from the entrepreneur's point of view, uh, it's moving really fast. So uh, the production of the green hydrogen is, is playing the biggest role in, in, the, in this whole picture because, as we know, uh, most of the hydrogen right now is produced uh, from the methane. Um, and, and to really get the hyd green hydrogen to the market, we need to increase the production of uh, electrolysis systems uh, and, and also direct uh, more of these electrolyzers uh, from the in this, the big industries like metal refineries and and, and then also uh, uh, from the e-fuel producers maybe uh, to the smaller users uh, to get the hydrogen really on hands of the people. Um, and uh, also most of the hydrogen right now is used by the big applications like trains, buses, uh, uh, also, the trucks uh, are already on the streets uh, in Switzerland, for example. Hyundai has uh, has really uh, taken uh, a, a big, big force of, of its fuel cell technology onto the roads. Uh, but, but really, to solve the chicken and the egg problem, again, uh, and get the social ac acceptance, uh, we need to consider also other applications uh, for the hydrogen, including um, the households, uh, also the, the other use cases where the diesel generators, for example, are uh, commonly used uh, nowadays. Um, because um, um, Korea, South Korea is one of the good examples uh, where the infrastructure is there, uh, there's buses and, and the cars available, but the society uh, has not uh, yet well adopted the hydrogen because of the of the social um, common um, uh, afraidness of the hydrogen as a dangerous uh, fuel uh, even though the hydrogen is as dangerous as as every other fuel um, so so definitely we need to deal with uh, social awareness and then how uh, power up is contributing to that is that uh, we are bringing to the market really the solution where which everyone can use and then uh, how we do it we as i told we are uh, contributing uh, and working together with uh, with local uh, players at uh, the refilling station operators so we opened the first hydrogen cabinet and talking about the carbon capture, um, in National Institute of uh, Chemical Physics and Biophysics, we actually have, uh, uh, together with the European Space Agency, we have been now starting developing of technology of uh, molten salt um, electrolysis, uh, which allows to capture uh, the CO2 um, in the form of, um, of carbon powders. Uh, which can be then used in batteries, in fuel cell industry, everywhere else. Um, so, so this is, I think, uh, important technology also to review and something interesting to to really consider. Uh, and and this is also uh, this is technology which can be implemented to the uh, methane reformers uh, to produce hydrogen uh, from the methane and carbon capture through that. It's quite easy and and can then, as I said, can be. Um, used elsewhere as well. 
And there's the video, but we don't have the time to watch this video, how the process is carried out. Um, um, but uh, later, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer to the questions or, or uh, send you some additional materials if you're interested in that. Um, so, um, and uh, as I said, uh, the Green Deal is there. Um, uh, the, the goals are really uh, high, uh, the set goals. And, and to reach these goals, uh, we need to get the hydrogen and the hydrogen technology um, to, the, to the hands of the citizens. And, and the easiest way is to start from the small to the big. Um, and that's where we are with Power Up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivar. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions at this moment because time is pressing and uh, our uh, high-level uh, policy discussion uh, is about to begin. Now, I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished panel that brings together key players, both from the public sector, the private sector. Welcome to the panel, Energy Commissioner Kadri Simson. Manager, Minister of Energy of Lithuania, Dainius Kreivis, Director General of the Ministry of Economic Affairs of Finland, Riku Huttunen. With me on the stage is uh, Timo Tatar, Deputy Secretary General of the Ministry of Economics and Communication of Estonia. We also have soon joining us Ingun Svegorten, the Vice President of uh, New Energy Solution at Equinor. Uh, and uh, Rasmus Erbo, the Vice President and Head of Continental Europe at Ørsted, is already with us. It's uh, a pleasure to have you all here. Now, I think it's fair to say that everyone uh, in the energy sector um, are anxious to see the new proposals so that Brussels is preparing to make the Green Deal a reality. Now, what will Fit for 55 cover? What are the initiatives from Brussels on offshore wind, decarbonization and hydrogen. Well, I think we'll know more in about 10 minutes when our next honored speaker, the Energy Commissioner Kadri Simson, has laid out her vision. Commissioner Simson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Johannes, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings, greetings from Brussels. And, and also, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to add uh, the voice of the European Union to this important conversation. And, uh, and um, well, when I was looking at this uh, distinguished panel, I thought uh, that it has been an unusual year for many of us. And actually, I hope that by now I would have already visited all the Nordic Baltic countries and I would have uh, had uh, several in-person meetings with everyone on this panel. Um, but well, as we know, uh, it was not possible. In, but uh, here in Brussels, uh, we had a chance um, to use uh, this uh, extraordinary um, situation. As we know, great challenges provide us also new opportunities. And uh, due to the pandemic, we had a chance to propose a historic age and recovery package. As we call it, uh, it is the next generation EU with uh, 750 billion euros. And... Um, in case of the recovery and resilience facility, at least 37% will be earmarked for climate-related investment. And of course, there is also a traditional long-term uh, MFF with more than one trillion. So um, the important thing to know is that we are not going back to normal. We are moving towards a better sense of uh, what normal is, and one where our climate goals are directly within our site, so climate neutrality within one generation and, and um, by the end of this decade, at least a 55% reduction in, emis in emissions. So we have the vision, we have the financing, and we have the political will to reach these goals. Uh, and now is the time to create uh, the structural change in our policies and, uh, and legislation to make them a reality. And that's why we will be announcing a number of regulations under the name of Fit for 55 package. Um, after two weeks, um, this will be uh, public on 14th of July. And right now, the Commission services are working closely together to, to propose the most complex package ever. Uh, this will include 12 proposals, for example, revision of the Renewable Energy Directive and Energy Efficiency Directive, also the Energy 
taxation directive and revision of the emissions trading system. And uh, all proposed measures will need to be um, complementary in order to achieve our climate goals um, in a cost-effective and sustainable way. Um, and we know that, uh, that um, this is not enough if uh, one or some sectors will contribute. Uh, the economy as a whole will need to contribute to it. And, uh, and uh, my mission is to ensure that it happens in a fair way on market terms. So, um, as I was mentioning earlier, earlier, the package is still under preparation. Um, but I will give you a sense of uh, what we want to achieve. So, the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive will um, present actions stemming from strategies adopted already last year. The Energy System Integration Strategy, the Hydrogen and Offshore Renewable Strategy, and, and also the Renovation Wave. And, and it will look uh, beyond the energy sector, also uh, considering uh, what was there in the bio biodiversity strategy. And of course, the main goal of our policy is to reduce emissions, but we also want to ensure EU leadership um, for renewables in different sectors, uh, in transport, heating and cooling, and also industry. And we will get there, thanks to both current technologies as well as new. The promising ones, uh, for example, such as renewable hydrogen. On transport, the Climate Target Plan requires um, increasing um, the share of renewables in the transport sector to 26% by 2030. And this will partially happen uh, thanks to innovative fuels, such as advanced biofuels and uh, hydrogen-based synthetic fuels. And this is going to help massively with the hard to decarbonize activities um, that will become cost competitive and see large market roll up post 2030. Uh, decarbonizing uh, heating and cooling um, and uh, doing that both in industry and in buildings will also be decisive uh, for our energy transition. And, uh, and uh, we know that it represents half of the EU energy consumption is more than three quarters of this energy being supplied right now by fossil fuels. So this is important. And with the biodiversity and forest strategies in mind, we need to find the right balance between the use of biomass for energy, but also preserving biodiversity and enhancing carbon sinks. So uh, Nordic countries lead the way for responsible biomass. Um, and, um, and you know how to do that without over-exploiting natural resources. Uh, but for its um, biomass has to be cultivated, produced and used in a sustainable way everywhere. So thanking the EU sustainability criteria for forest biomass is part of the assessment uh, of the renewable directive. And speaking of renewables, uh, I'm actually getting ahead of myself because the best energy is energy we don't even have to use and uh, decarbonization will go hand in hand with an increased ambition on energy efficiency. So the renovation wave aims to improve the energy performance of at least um, 35 million residential and non-residential non buildings by 2030. The possible extension of the ETS system to buildings and, and also the Energy Efficiency Directive will increase the rate and depth of renovations, starting with public sector buildings, and it will also drive demand for transparent um, energy performance data. And further to that, energy system integration is the next piece of the decarbonization puzzle. So our strategy describes three pillars. First, a more circular energy system with energy efficiency first at its core. Second, uh, accelerating electrification based on a low carbon and renewable based power system. And third, um, we are promoting renewable and low carbon fuels, including hydrogen, for hard to decarbonize sectors. In a nutshell, this means that achieving our climate targets, um, the most of energy needs will, uh, will be met by electricity. 
And digitalization uh, will tie the various processes and parts of the economy together. Um, it will enable coordinated planning and um, operation of the energy system as a whole across multiple energy carriers and infrastructures and consumption sectors. Um, as um, energy production and consumption become increasingly decentralized, energy markets and infrastructure will need to adapt to a more complex and integrated energy system. And this brings along um, close to real-time participation in the energy market markets and the need to protect the rights of the consumers. And we will be able to reach our objectives faster, especially um, in some sectors, um, in the cement, steel and chemical industries with carbon capture and utilization and storage. Um, we have seen excellent leadership in the Nordic um, when it comes to CCUS with projects like um, Northern Lights and Longship. And in the autumn, you should expect um, two new initiatives from our side. We will inaugurate the CCUS forum and we will start working on certification rules for carbon removals. And another tool uh, in our arsenal for reaching our targets is offshore renewable energy. Our strategy foresees a 30 time multiplication of electricity generation from offshore renewable sources by 2050. In the sea, we will need to be mindful of offshore grids and market frameworks, as well as industrial value change um, and jobs and research and innovation. Uh, but first and foremost, um, maritime spatial planning is the key um, to reconcile the various economic activities. And turning to infrastructure, we have spurred uh, the development of cross-border energy infrastructure over the past decade uh, through the 10E regulation and connecting Europe facility. And uh, the proposal for a revised 10E from December last year is instrumental in, the, um, in supporting the member states in uh, deploying offshore generation by 2050. Um, well, this month, 11th of June, um, ministers of the Council agreed uh, on a compromise text, which uh, includes a significant portion dedicated to offshore renewable energy. And, uh, and of course, uh, regional cooperation is um, the bonding agent for successful uh, mm, mm, takeoff of offshore energy. We are blessed with natural resources in our seas, but uh, those seas um, need a good cooperation framework. So working together to make the most of those resources is a must. And I'm proud to say that uh, exemplary regional cooperation in the um, region, especially in fora like the North Seas Energy Cooperation and the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan, is well advanced. And I'm looking forward to continuing this good work uh, together. And finally, we cannot forget uh, that um, the EU Green Deal is first and foremost a growth strategy. Uh, we estimate that uh, investments required by the transition to climate neutrality have the potential to create 600,000 jobs only in this decade. And that is um, many more than 200,000 jobs uh, that currently exist in the coal sector, for, in, for instance. Um, overall, in the longer um, time frame, more jobs will be created than lost. However, some territories will be impacted more than others. And it is particularly the case of coal, peat and uh, oil shell regions. Um, as well as areas um, that, uh, that home uh, that are homes uh, for carbon intensive industries. And this is why the Green Deal has a just transition at the core of its intention, uh, where our motto is uh, no one left behind. Specific support will be provided to most affected areas, sectors and communities uh, via just transition mechanism. Uh, this is built to mobilize over 100 billion in public and private investments. And some of this money will be uh, used for retraining and reskilling because we do expect that over 18 million EU workers will need to be retrained to develop uh, the skills that we will require uh, and that the new green economy will require. 
To conclude, uh, there is significant potential for collaboration between the Nordic and Baltic region. It's easy to name uh, the areas where you are leading the pack. Renewables, energy efficiency, CCUS, digitalization, research into storage technologies and uh, sustainable long-term governance and innovation. And the Nordic electricity market is a prime example for market integration. So uh, that doesn't mean that you are all the same. Uh, I know you are a group of countries that differ significantly, but even so, we know that uh, you are more, um, you will gain more as a group. Um, so, uh, so cooperation is key. And I hope that uh, the spirit of cooperation continues uh, on as we push for a clean energy transition. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Commissioner Simpson. I hope you have uh, five to eight minutes in your tight schedule to uh, be with us so I can ask the panelists for a quick comment. And by a quick comment, I really mean uh, 30 seconds to one minute. And if you can uh, insert a question to Kadri in your comment, uh, that would be complimentary. So Kadri can perhaps uh, uh, listen to the questions and answer them as uh, at once as a bulk. So I would first uh, give the floor to uh, our um, Lithuanian uh, colleague, uh, Minister uh, Daniel Skrevis. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, dear moderator, dear commissioner, the panelists. Uh, thank you, commissioner, for describing uh, EU agenda, uh, we discussed already in, in many different formats upcoming uh, changes, and I would like to say that uh, Lithuania is ready to commit uh, uh, to the EU targets uh, and to reach uh, uh, climate neutrality in uh, 2050 as well. We are well going in this way. In uh, 2020, we already had 27% uh, of our final energy consumption produced from uh, renewables. And uh, we are on the track uh, toward uh, other goals and uh, Energy, uh, renewable energy ambition have to have to increase, uh, and uh, and in uh, 2050 we are planning uh, to have almost 50 percent of renewable electricity. Uh, from another hand, uh, I would like to briefly note that uh, what uh, where we have concerns. Uh, first of all, uh, on uh, as you briefly mentioned, on the red two. Criteria on biomass. We should uh, be sure that the rules uh, could not uh, change us uh, in the middle of, of the game. And uh, I would like to 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 bit uh, extrapolate you if if you could, um, dear commissioner, on uh, possible criteria if we are going to to, to change because. Uh, in our uh, what what we consider that red two criteria uh, uh, are enough uh, to ensure that biomass is used sustainable, and um, so this is crucial for us because uh, we could find found ourselves otherwise in this situation we could not deliver on 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 the uh, uh, the targets you commission now describes. So generally we are committed to the to the green deal to the targets uh, and i would like that some some uh, changes uh, in biomass would not spoil the game so. minister i would kindly ask uh, the participants to keep your comments very short otherwise uh, we will not be able to take the questions as the commissioner has to leave us uh, riku huttunen from finland you have the floor Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much uh, to the to Commissioner. It's a huge package, and it, there will be a lot to comment. But uh, I'll be brief and take uh, take only two issues here. Uh, one of them is that we need huge investments in order to fulfill our climate targets, and uh, there are many issues concerning already energy efficiency directive and renewable energy directive i could i could comment but uh, but the main message is that uh, we should keep together 
the regulation as such that we enable investments and we enable cost-effective investments in order to fight the climate climate change. And, and uh, the issue is, for example, concerning the sustainability criteria. My other point is concerning the fact that uh, looking at the uh, Fit for 55 uh, package as a whole, maybe the new thing is that it affects our citizens very directly and very clearly, be it effort sharing, be it uh, buildings, be it uh, transport. And this should be taken into consideration. And that's another reason to concentrate on very cost cost effective instruments and finally uh, uh, dear commissioner I, I would invite you to the nordic meeting of energy ministers in september virtually or or physically and i've understood you have already taken a positive stance on that so thank you very much thank you very much mr hutton and uh, timo Tatar, do you have a question for the commissioner uh, yeah first of all thank you for for um, for introducing the package we know now what to expect, so it's only two weeks to go. Um, yeah, for us, um, of course, the same topics which were mentioned by Rico and the uh, Lithuanian minister are, are also important. Uh, but may maybe another uh, element which I would like to draw attention is that uh, no doubt we have witnessed within the last two years uh, during the COVID pandemic that not all the EU regulations are followed. So. We, we saw very quickly uh, building up the walls and, uh, and borders and restricting trade uh, within the EU in a way no one imagined before. So, and if that would happen in an energy, in an energy market, then that would have a dramatic uh, consequences. So uh, my question is how to sort of build up the trust that no matter what the EU uh, internal energy policy rules are followed, because this is a fundamental thing uh, for us to go forward. Otherwise, you know, the whole structure and architecture would be something different. Looking at the time, I suggest, uh, Commissioner, if you may take those uh, questions you received, answer them, and then let's see if we can squeeze in two more minutes uh, in your schedule to take uh, two more questions. So, Kadri, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you for very good questions. I will start with uh, um, Timo's question, but how can we well, uh, be certain that our energy system will stay resilient? Um, well, I think that the best um, answer is that in practice, um, we didn't witness any disruptions, even during the um, hottest days of the pandemic. And, uh, and now we can start negotiating higher targets only because the previous um, packages. I will refer to clean energy for all a uh, package that helps us um, to strive for more electrification. And and as as I was already mentioning, uh, um, Nordic Baltic uh, electricity market is a very good example how you can ac accommodate more renewables um, when you have a well functioning uh, regional market. Um, I myself, uh, along with Timo, uh, four years ago, we were um, negotiating uh, all those uh, um, parts of this package. And one of those was a renewable energy directive that we are now opening again. And I do recognize that uh, one of the most um, controversial topics um, in renewable directive might be um, the role of um, forest biomass. Mm, I do remember that four years ago we achieved agreement that uh, that strengthened the sustainability criteria, and this actually comes into force after tomorrow, first of uh, July. So we will see this impact in real life uh, soon, uh, and uh, and I truly hope that our member states are taking care of their forests. But you know that uh, that here in in. Um, European Commission, we have different services, and, uh, and, um, and we will propose our um, legislative uh, um, uh, package uh, in a collegial way. So uh, right now, the exact details, how we will further strengthen the sustainability criteria is still under negotiations. 
and uh, and and of course um, the transition will impact all of us. Um, we know that we mainly achieved our 2020 targets because of the change in uh, power generation and in industry. We were not so successful uh, in transport or building sector. But this is one of the reasons why, uh, why in this Fit for 55 package, there will be also a um, proposal to extend uh, ETS to those sectors that, uh, uh, that have not shown such a um, development so far. Um, but of course, we will uh, propose it along with a solution how to address uh, social impact to, to the most vulnerable customers. And as I was uh, mentioning already, this Fit for 55 package will be one of the most ambitious ones because different ministers will start negotiating different uh, parts and it all, all has to come together. So if you change something, then the other proposals might lose uh, their uh, um, well, um, their balance, but uh, but I uh, but I saw from minister's side in this uh, this council uh, there is a strong willingness um, to commit to higher targets. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've exhausted the time of the commissioner Kadri. But if you can still uh, stay with us for two more minutes, nod if you can. Oh, wonderful! Then we have time for two more questions from uh, Rasmus. And Ingun, if you can be very brief and uh, respect the uh, timetable of the of the commissioner. Let's start with Rasmus. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I will be very brief. Uh, my comment and my question uh, relates to uh, hybrid solutions, so where offshore wind is connected to more than one country, as you know. Um, in us, this is a key focus for us. We are actually currently developing four different hybrid projects, uh, two in Denmark, uh, one in uh, Estonia uh, and Latvia, together with ST Energia, uh, and one in Norway. Uh, and we believe that all of these four potential projects uh, demonstrate the benefits of hybrid solutions. But none of them can progress really without a very clear European uh, regulatory framework. So my question will basically be uh, whether the commissioner can talk a little bit about the timing in terms of when we will have the, mo the planned amendment of the relevant EU uh, market uh, rules that will better facilitate offshore uh, hybrid solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Ingun Svegarten, your question or comment? We cannot hear you, Ingun. Are... No, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Commissioner, and, and great to, to listen to, to your remarks. And we look forward to uh, more that will come uh, from, from the Fit for 55 legislative agenda. Um, I will also be very brief, and, and uh, as an offshore wind developer and a focus on, on that, I, I think one, one of the questions, I also support Rasmus's question as a very important one, uh, but, but maybe another question then linked to, to the European global leadership within offshore wind. Uh, we believe to, co to continue to keep that position. Um, we, uh, we, we need to, to allow for more access uh, and more access to acres at speed and, and, and conditions that are attractive also in the in the global terms. Uh, as we see that other regions also outside the EU have, have increased their ambitions. How confident are you that we will retain investments in Europe uh, compared to, to, to other regions like the US and, and Asia? Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Kadri, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I, I do believe that uh, keeping our competitive uh, uh, position in, uh, in technological solutions where we do have this is, is a very important uh, part of our work. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, I had a uh, meeting, um, bilateral meeting, um, uh, on the margins of uh, EU-US summit with, uh, with um, Secretary Raimondo, who is um, responsible for offshore development in the United States. And, uh, and in this regard, they are very much interested about our um, well, know-how and also uh, cooperation uh, in this regard. Um, for us, all our long-term uh, um, strategies are showing that we need significantly more electricity to cover our demand. Um, 
and we see waste potential for that in offshore uh, um, generation. To, um, to achieve, um, well, we have mapped all the possible bottlenecks uh, that, uh, that hold back the development in uh, five sea basins uh, here in Europe. Uh, we will address them in our different proposals. Uh, partly, it will be addressed uh, in red. Um, financing the Creed connections uh, was already addressed um, in the 10E proposal, and I'm really um, very much um, appreciate uh, the result of the Portuguese presidency that they they achieved a general approach among different uh, different. Um, uh, viewpoints uh, that were present uh, during the council meeting in in Luxembourg. Now I hope that soon European Parliament will also um, vote on their position, and we can we can uh, start trialogues so that um, next financing list for the infrastructure will already cover also uh, renewable. Uh, creed, well, well, offshore creed, and and um, and uh, indeed, uh, in our offshore strategy, we mentioned that this is not only bottom fixed offshore, but uh, but for other sea basins, the solution might be floating offshore, or or why not uh, tidal or uh, or wave energy. So, um, if you see. Uh, clear um, barriers that don't allow you to proceed with your projects, let us know. Uh, my team is uh, very much willing to well address all those possible um, uh, restrictions. Thank you so much. And now I have to leave because uh, I have to launch a new uh, virtual uh, conference with other colleagues. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kadri Simson, uh, dear Commissioner. Thanks for extending your stay with us. All questions from the panelists uh, were answered, and I wish you uh, best of luck opening the next um, conference. Uh, dear friends, um, uh, dear colleagues in the panel who you will remain with us, uh, it's now time to speak a bit more freely. Uh, we've uh, scheduled about three to five minute uh, interventions to each and every one of us on the topic closest uh, to your heart. And uh, if, um, if I may start with um, the energy minister from Lithuania, Mr. Kravis, uh, who uh, perhaps can touch a bit um, on the, one of the main topics today, the offshore uh, wind strategy. How does Lithuania see that? But also uh, the, um, the future of gas in Lithuania, which of course uh, plays a big role today. Uh, Minister Kravis, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to start from offshore wind. Uh, Lithuania's offshore wind uh, potential is 3.5 gigawatt, and we are examining possibility to to move as fast as we can with the uh, development of, of offshore wind. And the first uh, tender for uh, 700 megawatts uh, wind farm is planned in the end of 2024, and the next wind farm uh, is, is, uh, is will follow in, in the coming year, in 2025. So as well, having the scope of potential, we are uh, ready to invite other countries to to have uh, joint projects uh, with, with with Lithuania with our country. Uh, as well, the uh, offshore offshore wind uh, is uh, let's say is one one leg, uh, and uh, the capabilities to bal to balance uh, and to store the energies another and, and hydrogen. Hydrogen is is uh, a key priority um, for balancing capabilities of uh, the first uh, parks. Lithuania is planning to use the battery, which uh, is uh, currently uh, we, we currently we have tender for this battery 20, 20 hundred megawatts uh, uh, battery and. Uh, and we we expecting uh, it to be built uh, at the end of 
of of the next year and uh, in the beginning uh, battery is going to serve as as uh, a major reserve uh, of our system and after synchronization with uh, continental europe uh, we are going to use it to, to balance uh, offshore wind parks uh, extrapolating on on the gas sector, um, uh, actually we see the decrease of, ga- uh, of uh, gas con- consumption in, uh, in in Baltic in Baltic uh, countries. Uh, but beside us in the Poland, uh, uh, we observe uh, the increasing demand. Let's say and Polish strategy to have. Uh, uh, Energy mix, which consists from uh, nuclear power, um, gas, and and uh, renewables, we, uh, give us chances. You know, we have uh, LNG terminal to to trade and to to uh, use the possibility of, of Polish market. Uh, Polish uh, gas uh, gas. Uh, Gas, gas system, the company, is expecting that uh, Poland, uh, Poland's cons- consumption of, uh, of gas is going to increase from 20 uh, BCM to, to 34 BCM. It, it, it is uh, a huge market for us. And, and in the beginning of next year, the, the connector uh, Gipl uh, is, uh, is going to be open. And this this creates a uh, huge uh, potential for all Baltic markets uh, and uh, the participants to uh, to trade and to exchange uh, exchange uh, energy uh, among among us. Uh, so, briefly, uh, uh, offshore wind is huge uh, huge future. We are moving fast. Hydrogen and, and battery uh, uh, we will develop for, for balancing capabilities and for storage. Uh, gas market in the Baltics uh, is in decrease, but but Polish market is is is, uh, is huge, uh, promising uh, uh, land for for us. So shortly, shortly. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I would move on with uh, the Director General, Mr. Riku Huttunen, from the Ministry of Economic Affairs of Finland. Um, Mr. Huttunen, what is the um, what is important in the European Green Deal for Finland? Thank you very much. And uh, after the Minister's introductory remarks here, so I would also like to. Uh, points out that uh, developing our grids and energy markets is very important. But uh, I would focus on uh, two or three themes uh, here. One of them is technology neutrality. Uh, We have already seen the proposals concerning uh, taxonomy or part of them, actually, by, by, by the European Commission. And uh, we have heard rumors about the preparations of uh, Fit for 55. And uh, it's a deep concern to us that we are not uh, really following uh, the path of uh, technology neutrality here. For me, it means that we should uh, uh, look at all energy sources which are clean and uh, sustainable the same way, be it nuclear, be it biomass, be it hydro. A bit, uh, what, whatever, and that's uh, that's an important point for us. My uh, second favorite subject, maybe, is uh, sector integration or or system integration, whatever word you want to use. But uh, uh, it's uh, extremely important for the future that our energy systems uh, interplay is very efficient. We have electricity systems, we have gas systems, we have uh, heating, we have transport, we have industries. And uh, all of them should form a big uh, integrated whole where we use our energy very uh, efficiently and where we can uh, decrease the amount of uh, emissions. 
and uh, if one looks at Finland especially and sector integration so the biggest challenges are in in the heating sector uh, well that's common to Nordics and Baltics of course but uh, uh, we are furthest north and uh, another very important uh, sector for us is uh, energy intensive industries uh, be it steel industries uh, be it forest industry our very big chemical industrial sector for example if we if we really are uh, are uh, trying and we are trying to reach our climate neutrality target in finland which is by 2035 so the final very important step is to decarbonize our our industries and uh, offshore wind has been mentioned uh, mentioned many times and maybe i'll comment on that as well uh, we are not the first not the first comers there and uh, we are actually just trying to make uh, different kinds of policies and facilitate the construction of uh, offshore wind here in finland uh, on the other hand we can also avoid the uh, the mistakes maybe made by some uh, some countries globally but uh, to me offshore wind is a possibility to uh, increase uh, clean electricity production that's uh, not too expensive and what we need for the future is electrification of uh, of our activities in in many many sectors and uh, I would also like to remind you about the time schedules, the timetables. It takes 10 to 15 years to construct an offshore uh, wind, wind park, and you need to construct also the connections, be it cables for electricity, or maybe something we should really uh, think about uh, deeper, and that's, uh, that's uh, producing hydrogen or uh, methanol or whatsoever uh ee fuel from from the offshore power thank you very much thank you very much uh, mr hutton and well it's always good to have someone physically present at those uh, virtual conferences and i'm uh, happy to see timo tatar here timo the the question of um, technology neutrality uh was brought in by by mr hutton and uh, just uh, as an intriguing idea, should we use this European Green Deal money to also invest in uh, nuclear energy? Well, first of all, I guess um, that we should uh, maintain the principle that the investments into the production are made purely on uh, private equity and, um, and uh, we should keep the state uh, subsidies in any forms as, as low as uh, minimum. So uh, for us as a policy makers, uh, we should first of all focus on uh, preparing the market rules and regulations the way which, uh, which uh, attracts new investments. And of course, as long as it is uh, climate neutral, carbon neutral, be it uh, nuclear or be it uh, wind energy or solar, uh, everything which helps us to move towards the climate neutrality goal, I believe, is beneficial. Uh, and, and of course, uh, for, for that, we, we, I hope that the Fit for 55 uh, package will uh, promote uh, those uh, principles that it is transparent, market-based, and also promotes investments in a way that we will prevent this endless subsidy loop that all the investments are made purely and based on uh, subsidies and uh, and if all of a sudden you know we phase out subsidies you know the, the whole investment wave will stop so i think we have to build up a, a regulation where this is avoided so in that sense uh, fit for 55 but we should avoid you know one size fits all uh, policy so every country has its own uh, unique approach how to tackle the, their climate uh, neutrality challenge. For us, for Estonia, the next 10 years is mainly onshore wind, but that, that, as it was rightfully mentioned, offshore wind is, is, is coming. 
uh, and it takes time, so we have to prepare already now in order to see the first offshore wind farms uh, picking up, hopefully uh, subsidy on a subsidy-free uh, foundation uh, after 2030. So uh, those are the elements which we are working. So uh, we have seen the ETS uh, system working quite nicely in the way that we we have witnessed in Estonia the last two years the highest decrease of energy sector uh, emissions in Europe. And now, of course, our challenge is to replace the, the power production, which which is now most of the time on standby with something which is uh, renewable, which is future-proof, and which is uh, online uh, uh, more, more time uh, than, than the, the fossil units. So we see that for Estonia, this is wind. We have also witnessed uh, a solar boom in Estonia. So last year, roughly 400 megawatts of wind sorry, uh, PV panels were installed in Estonia, and we are already seeing the benefits of, of those investments. So, uh, and, and, to, and to speed up the pace, uh, we plan to initiate uh, two large, large, rather large-scale uh, renewable energy auctions in coming years, one in this year in autumn and the, the other in 2023, altogether, altogether 1.1 terawatt hours of uh, new renewable energy demand uh, from, from government side. But still, I, I would stress that uh, we have to find a way towards 2050 how, how those investments are mainly subsidy free or there is clear perspective how, how we reach the point where investments are made market based. Otherwise, you know, the renewable energy uh, or, or the Green Deal would simply be too expensive. So we have to be always clever, we to find the ways how, how to pick the lowest uh, hanging fruits first. Well, it's a good uh, moment to bring in uh, the, the private sector. Uh, Rasmus, uh, uh, Ørsted is, uh, is heavily investing um, in the Baltic Sea region. You have massive plans in Poland. Uh, you're also negotiating with Eesti uh, Energia and uh, planning to build an offshore wind park here. Now, is it possible to do that without state subsidies and guarantees? And what is it, what is it that you exa exactly expect from the policy framework? Uh, do we have one-size-fits-all solutions uh, for the EU? Each and every member state should follow the same path in getting those uh, investments uh, in the region, or uh, what is it that you exactly want? Thank you very much. Um, those are very good and very relevant questions, um, which I'll be very happy to answer. So I think first, uh, Johannes, if I could just, just take one step back uh, and talk about the potential that we see for the, for the Baltic Sea, uh, because it is, it is massive. And I think that is important to bear in mind when we, when we think about this, that from an Oster perspective, this is beyond uh, country to country. We see it more as a regional uh, opportunity. Where you basically have a you know an economical potential for the Baltic Sea uh, region for expectedly more than 90 gigawatts. The technical potential is of course significantly higher for offshore wind, but the economical potential is probably around 90 gigawatts. Poland that you talked about before, where we are uh, 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 heavily invested together with our partner PG, has a potential, I believe, to to get close to 30 gigawatts. So, so, so the Baltic Sea has potential opportunities and also growing ambitions, um, and therefore we very much see, in terms of of what we would like to see, uh, we very much see the next part of of the journey. Uh, for instance, in in uh, in the Baltic states, uh, to to zoom in on creating a a regulatory framework as soon as possible that. That, that can deliver uh, on these ambitions. Because I think an important point to, to highlight here that the potential in the Baltic Sea is very much there, but it is uh, not distributed uh, in terms of offshore wind potential according to needs and power consumption, right? So if you, for instance, see Germany, uh, Germany has a very significant need for, for, for all of the green electricity that it can get its hands on. And we therefore, we therefore believe in us very strongly in 
uh, the ability to to deliver a much tighter uh, cross border cooperation across the Baltic Sea. And what we, for instance, have seen uh, between the Estonian and Latvian governments in terms of plan for for cross border project, which will be a first of its kind, is exactly what what made us uh, together with uh, with Enfit um, uh, embark on a journey uh, in uh, Latvia and Estonia because we see that um, we see that commi- you know political political commitment. Uh, but to uh, but to uh, directly respond to the point on whether whether there is a one uh, fits all, um, I I fully agree uh, to to the point made by by Timo uh, that uh, that uh, that is not uh, necessarily the case. Um, you can take the North Sea Energy Island as an example, uh, where the Danish government has put out uh, ambitious and right very good plans in terms of building a t- up to ten gigawatt energy island in the North Sea expectedly connected to two or three of our uh, uh, neighboring countries. That's a very significant uh, long-term anticipatory uh, uh, investment, which which requires uh, an element of subsidy to basically unleash uh, the full uh, ambition, uh, clearly. The same you can, say, you can say about Poland. Take the first round of direct awards in Poland here, where Ørsted and PGE, have 2.5 gigawatts out of the 5.9 gigawatts that has been offered, you know, offered out. Uh, so, so roughly 40% of that uh, pot, you can uh, you can say. And by the way, together with with our colleague uh, from uh, colleagues from Equinor, that is on a 25 year uh, CFD, uh, so a a price stabilization mechanism, which the Polish uh, government has believed uh, was needed in order to get the full uh, ramp up uh, quickly enough uh, on the Polish side. And then you have additional five gigawatts coming in two auctions in 25 and 27, uh, which would then expectedly uh, see, see probably a different level once the local supply chain uh, has, has, has truly picked up. Um, so, so I do believe uh, that we should avoid a one-size-fits-all on the one hand side, on the other hand, we also need a very, as we also talked about with the commissioner before, we need a, a, a strong um, framework for collaboration uh, between member states, but also between TSOs and developers and, and individual de- developers, because otherwise we will simply not be able to deliver on the 300 gigawatts uh, by, by uh, 2050. For, of, of, of offshore wind. And then maybe to answer the second part of your question in terms of what it is that we look for, um, if you take a step back uh, in us, when we enter into a new market, um, which we have recently done, uh, Estonia, Latvia is one example, uh, Norway is another example where there is also a, a floating opportunity. It's basically that we look for we look for three things. We look for 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 ambitious uh, political targets. We look for a transparent regulatory framework, and then we look for a pipeline of projects. If we see these three things, uh, then, uh, then 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 we will come, uh, and and investments uh, will follow. Uh, and then just maybe on a on an on a happy note, uh, so to speak, uh, responding to uh, to uh, Mr. Hutchin and comment on. That it takes uh, 10 to 12 years to build an offshore wind farm. Uh, we can do it faster than that, uh, and we do believe that the offshore wind potential uh, in Finland uh, is very much there uh, in the south, where where the onshore grid is uh, is uh, is strong and close to load centers. So uh, so we would certainly uh, be, be 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 happy to do it uh, much quicker than that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will now hand over the floor to Ingun uh, Svegorten. Uh, Ingun, um, how do you see the future learning curves in offshore wind uh, to actually get the costs down? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I think before before we actually question again, but before we go into that, uh, let me also um, uh, take a take a wider view of, of the context and where we are because we are in the biggest transition our energy system has ever seen uh, renewables are growing rapidly and over time oil and gas will uh, play a smaller role 
uh, so this transition will create a lot of opportunities. And I think Equinor as a broad energy company uh, will is well placed to to take advantage of that. We are therefore accelerating our growth within renewables and low carbon, and expect to invest uh, well above fifty billion dollars um, towards twenty thirty in in these uh, segments. But Europe is also uniquely positioned to develop, especially to take advantage of its vast offshore wind resources that many have talked about today. Um, and so our expectation to to the legislative framework is therefore a strong commitment uh, to develop and accelerating that. And the European Commission itself has said that the the pace is too slow towards the the the, the the, the strategic target for, for 2040 and 50. And, and we agree, and I think we need to do uh, better, uh, all of us together. So there's a lot of work ahead of us uh, for doing that. And I think the, the Fit for 55 legislation will be an impacting point of departure. And from a policy point of view, and Rasmus touched upon many of the same thing, we need to improve uh, the access. We need pipeline, as he said, we need to improve the access of, of new quality acreage. Uh, we need uh, design targeted funding to industrialize floating wind. And, and, and just to pick up on your point on how to decrease the cost, floating wind is no longer about pilot projects. Uh, we, we have the technology, but we need to scale it up industrially. Uh, and so so this, uh, this is a big challenge because floating will have to be a big share of the solution for, for offshore wind in Europe. And then we need to, hand, to enhance the grid capacity. Um, and the connectivity. And we need, as Rasmus well pointed out, to design a solid regulatory framework for the hybrid project, pro, projects. And, and we see them especially in, uh, we see them both in North Sea and, and, and the Baltic Sea especially. So we as a developer will have to do our share of the heavy lifting. Um, and for Europe, North Sea is our home turf where we today operate several assets, but uh, also including the world first floating wind park, Hive in Scotland. A lot more will come our way as we're currently building Doggebunk, the world's biggest offshore wind farm, and also Hive in Tumpen, a scaled up uh, floating wind park, a first one that will supply power to a couple of oil and gas installations in the North Sea. Baltic Sea, as mentioned here, has a promising conditions for repeating the success uh, that we've seen in the North Sea. And uh, our, our approach here has been, as we do in other markets, to move early and secure scale. But to, uh, so to address your question, scale is uh, uh, and a big enabler for profitable growth to get the cost down. We need scale globally, we need to scale regionally, and we need to scale uh, locally. And that's also why we look at scale from a basin perspective, not necessarily from a country uh, to country uh, perspective. But Poland is a perfect example for us. This is a country we know well since the 1990s. And we were among the first one to move into this offshore wind market in 2018 in the absence of any regulatory framework. So that has allowed us time to develop these projects together with Polanagia, our partner, and also uh, in, in parallel with the government working on, on the uh, regulatory framework. And now we're very pleased to have reached a significant milestone of the CFT of two of our most uh, mature uh, projects. And that's really a start of a journey because now we will have to shape this together uh, going forward, together with the government and together with building a local supply chain. So I think so. I think together is a key word. There's no European Commission, no government, or no company that can shape this uh, this uh, alone. We fully depend on each other um, to get to the goal of climate neutrality down the road. So we are accelerating, but we are also ready to engage uh, to play on on the instruments mentioned here today uh, that will also uh, push this in in the right direction. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Ingun. Uh, Timo, let's talk a bit about cooperation uh, in uh, in the Baltic Sea and in between the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how would you develop uh, a policy framework for even better cooperation between the three uh, Baltic states? I mean, we have the Baltic Energy Market Integration Plan, but could we foster it more uh, so that markets would be even further integrated and uh, and we could have more renewable energy mm -hmm. uh, available. Could we do that somehow uh, more efficiently than we're doing it today? Uh, def definitely we can. So, uh, of, of course, the Baltic Energy Inter Market Integration Plan has been a success story so far. But I, I sense that 
it is right now in a phase where it, it needs sort of renew its vision. And uh, for me, the most inspiring vision is the Baltic Offshore Creed Initiative, where, where really all the uh, Baltic Sea states could, could come together, first discuss and then make decisions how, how to develop really the uh, offshore uh, energy grid. So we, we, we heard today that there is a uh, great potential of offshore wind in, in Baltic Sea, more than 90 gigawatts, but we also know what is the larger st uh, tum stumbling stone. So it's the lack of uh, grid access. So the grid is the most expensive element of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the offshore grid. Otherwise, we would see the offshore projects popping up uh, already sooner and with less subsidies. So if we could jointly tackle that challenge, really bring, bring all the Baltic Sea EU member states around one table, uh, put the TSOs together in one room, you know, and, and uh, work out the plan how, how to develop uh, the offshore grid, which, you know, uh, connects all the sweet spots of wind energy in Baltic Sea and directs them directly to, to the spot uh, in, around Baltic Sea where the deficit that given hour is the highest, then, then th that would be sort of the, the, new, uh, the new level uh, of, of uh, Baltic Sea cooperation. And I, I, I really say Baltic Sea cooperation, not only Baltic cooperation, because I feel so far, uh, so far that you know we, we have Baltic cooperation, we have Nordic cooperation, but we we are lacking this Baltic Nordic cooperation. And one thing definitely which unites us is the Baltic Sea, and this this is where you know the energy comes, where where the large amount of offshore energy uh, is. So and uh, if if this is what unites us, if if this is where where the challenge is, you know, uh, lack of the greed, then this is a perfect foundation uh, to to really boost up the, the energy cooperation uh, there I, i'm very very much inspired of the idea and, and this this is the reason why we we together with latvia have uh, initiated the, the hybrid project uh, uh, where, where we exactly intend to do the same uh, in, a, in a smaller scale that that we are developing additional uh, interconnection between Estonia and Latvia and linking an area suitable for, for wind farm development there. This is the project called Elwind. And I really hope that this could be sort of a start of, of a longer journey where there we see a lot of Elwinds here and there in Baltic Sea linking together, bringing the energy which we need direct, uh, directly where, where the deficit is higher. How does this proposal sound from uh, Finland and uh, Lithuania, I wonder? Uh, Mr. Huttunen, would you like to join in? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy to join after Timo because we have such a good cooperation in, in many fields, uh, electricity markets, gas markets. And uh, we, we are kind of interconnector between Nordics and Baltics because uh, we have very close cooperation in synchronized electricity market with uh, with our Nordic uh, Nordic uh, colleagues and uh, on gas we have very very close uh, cooperation and markets with uh, Baltic states and uh, and so on. Uh, my point actually is that we we should look where where uh, the cooperation is most fruitful, and uh, I would just once again underline the importance of uh, grids. Uh, to comment uh, to comment to Rasmus, I'm happy. Uh, I'm sure that Ørsted can be very effective in constructing uh, uh, offshore wind uh, parks, but uh, we have to connect them to our grids, and our grids have to be strong enough to uh, to swallow the energy coming from there. Or then the other option, which which I really much uh, would uh, would uh, like to underline, is is to have new solutions, new technologies, power to X, uh, uh, whatsoever. And, and the importance of grids is underlined by the fact that, uh, for example, our, our dear neighbor Sweden, uh, which is a very potential candidate for cooperation uh, projects on, on offshore, they have big problems with their grid, uh, grid uh, 
capacity at the moment and they have four uh, price zones and and things like that so so we have to be very careful in constructing such such investments and such uh, projects that uh, that our energy grids uh, can can manage thank you Mr. Kravis, uh, how do you see the challenges in connecting the Baltic Sea region with uh, fresh renewables uh, coming from offshore? The grid bottleneck is an issue for Lithuania. Would you, would you like to join in into this big, uh, big room that Timo offered, where all the TSOs could come together and uh, draw this new uh, Baltic Sea region uh, power grid that will help us all in the greener future? Thank you. As Timo already mentioned, that we signed the uh, uh, agreement of six countries around uh, around the Baltics of development uh, for development of, of the grid as well. Uh, Besides the lack uh, lack uh, of grid development in in our region, uh, what what I mentioned. Uh, where Cooperation could could, could we expand our cooperation is is good stability and the measures to keep keep uh, uh, adequacy of the system and and balance of the system uh, uh, issue of which could be shared am, among all of us uh, and uh, in the Baltics uh, uh, we are trying to do do so and uh, and. Uh, uh, investing, uh, investing in uh, in in the grid stability, Lithuania as well supports supports our Baltic colleagues, uh, our our colleagues in the Baltics, uh, in, uh, investing in in the uh, interconnectors uh, uh, between between uh, Latvia, Estonia as well. They they uh, put their uh, um, efforts as well to to make our our grid stable. So so. Stability, uh, stability of grid, balance, uh, balance uh, of the grid, uh, adequacy uh, of the system is is, is going to be challenged uh, when we uh, are going to when we are going to, uh, to integrate so so huge amount of of renewables. So cooperation in this regard uh, is is very needed and uh, and uh, must be developed. There's one topic uh, that uh, created a lot of buzz uh, also um, uh, during the warm-up session, and that is hydrogen. I think we should touch a bit uh, upon that also. We still have about five minutes left uh, of our debate. Uh, Erasmus, uh, uh, how could uh, offshore wind be linked up to hydrogen through electro electrolysis? Is that the word in English, I think? Well, is, anyway, yes. is, that, is that in your plans? Yeah. Absolutely, uh, it is, uh, Johannes, and and I am very happy that you that you that you bring station here. Um, without going through our resume, we are currently uh, developing uh, uh, nine uh, hydrogen projects uh, across uh, Europe. Where I think the most notable ones uh, are probably a project that is called CH2 Land, uh, where we expect to in uh, the Netherlands, where we expect to connect a two gigawatt offshore wind farm to a one gigawatt uh, onshore electrolyzer, and the other one is uh, a project called Green Fuel for Denmark, where we uh, have a, a plan to scale up to uh, also a little bit more than one gigawatt uh, of uh, electrolysis uh, in Copenhagen which will be supplied uh, by uh, the offshore wind that will eventually come from the energy island of Bonhart. Um, so therefore, absolutely, there is a very significant potential for linking, um, linking offshore wind to uh, uh, electrolysis and also uh, to the many comments that have been made to which I fully agree on the challenges of grid constraints, especially onshore, that of course uh, hydrogen provides a, a relief, you can say, in the sense that you can put your electrolyzer close to shore and thereby um, thereby uh, taking the offtake, uh, you can say, from the wind farm before it hits the onshore grid. Um, so I think on the uh, on the regulatory side, um, it is uh, it is important. I think right now, also with respect to the red two, that we don't um, uh, tangle the the, that we don't put too stringent additionality requirements uh, to the renewable energy sources that are feeding the electrolyzers. This will make the significant growth uh, quite, quite, uh, you know, potentially limiting that. So that is one of our 
our regulatory focus points in Ørsted right now, making sure that we don't put too stringent additionality requirements on, on that. Uh, so we basically propose that they will only be phased in uh, after 25, allowing the industry to pick up a little bit. But yes, uh, uh, I certainly see significant potential here, and we do that in Ørsted as well. Ingun, what kind of uh, potential do you see for um, hydrogen? Yes, I think... <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you for that question. I, and I think we, we see both the high potential, but we also see it's it's completely necessary to succeed uh, with with the, the hydrogen market to to be able to to also abate uh, the 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 harder to abate uh, uh, products and 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 processes that we have. So so one thing I think we we see it from both angles. We see it as a as a huge opportunity to decarbonize. Uh, the 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 gas value chains and and other uh, and other processes and we also see it as a uh, as a as a enabler for the offshore wind and the and the and the acceleration of of renewables so i think we 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 see it in 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 the broad spectrum of of uh, what we do uh, in the in the energy transition what is the future of hydrogen seen from estonia demo Yep, yeah, definitely when it comes to hydrogen, then we are facing a complex issue because right now there is uh, no demand and there is no supply, So, which means that we have to create sort of, first of all, the market. So we have to figure out the future sectors where where hydrogen indeed is the non, uh, non-regret uh, solution. And, and at the same time, we have to invest into renewables in order to reach to the point where the price of renewables is low enough to really uh, make it affordable to to store the renewable energy in a form of hydrogen. So that's a comp- complex issue, which which definitely has to be solved. The regulation is here a key, uh, and uh, when it comes to Estonia, we are right now preparing uh, a a measure where we where we incentivize uh, such uh, value chain projects starting from uh, gen- uh, producing of uh, green hydrogen and then uh, and transporting and storing it and, and then using it in the end sector. So we would gain the first experience of, uh, of, of the whole uh, hydrogen value chain. So right now we are in, we are in the learning phase. Uh, uh, how 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 the how the market works? What are the barriers then? Uh, and after that, uh, we we can uh, prepare a a roadmap uh, uh, for for hydrogen. So uh, it's still pretty much new thing for Estonia, but we know that it is coming, and we know what are the key key factors here. One is to find the sectors where it is really a non-regret solution, and the other is to in- invest heavily into renewables that we see. In the future, in the point that uh, green hydrogen, you know, the supply will be there. Mm. Well, I know the time time's up, but I'm I'm still curious to know what uh, our our Finnish and Lithuanian colleagues uh, think about the future of hydrogen. I would first give the floor to uh, Mr. Huttunen. How do you see the future of hydrogen? Is it um, um, irreplaceable in our energy mix? Thank you. In 10 years or so, it's a must here in Finland because we have to decarbonize our industry. So, so for still industrial uh, pro- uh, processes as well, chemical industry processes, we just have to make that happen. Thank you. And Minister Kravis, uh, the futures in hydrogen. Inevitably, the Baltic region is destined to export energy, uh, in, and uh, the possibility to export uh, and store is uh, is only by hydrogen. So, this is is future. This is possibility for us, uh, and uh, and we need to embrace the, this this possibility. And Lithuania is as well is uh, looking very carefully. We, we started. Uh, uh, platform of, uh, for hydrogen where companies and, and the state institutions joined uh, efforts to develop uh, d- develop future strategy for hydrogen and start uh, and we are starting some pilot projects uh, in, in Lithuania. 
Dear friends, dear colleagues, thank you so much for uh, spending an inspiring uh, morning that has uh, unnoticeably turned into an afternoon. Uh, I do apologize for uh, taking a bit more time uh, from your calendars uh, than uh, originally proposed in the schedule, but because uh, you're simply so interesting to listen to, I cannot hold back my questions. Thank you once again. Uh, the Green Deal will be a great opportunity to further integrate the Nordic and Baltic energy markets and foster innovation that the region is already well known for. Thank you once again for participating. Uh, a recording of the event will be made uh, public soon and uh, I'll see you all soon in, in our greener, renewable future.